This is the Wally and Mathot Show. Now, here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Wallace. He's 13-year NHL veteran defenseman, Mark Mathot. Now, Math, it's our 13th episode. Some might call it lucky number 13. Others don't like the number 13 at all. And so, I guess we'll start on, are you a numbers guy? Like, are you a Friday the 13th, stay away from me, black cats under the ladders? What type of guy are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not superstitious when it comes to the number 13. I mean, I get it. And it is strange eh, when you go to hotels, sometimes you don't see the 13th floor on the, uh, on the number pad, but no, I, you know, for me, it's salt, salt shakers. I can't drop them under no circumstance. Can I ever drop the salt? And if I do, it's over both shoulders just to be safe. And I've been like that for as long as I can remember. I don't know why. But why? So, I, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like it's just something that I kind of learned over the years and it's like a bad omen. I just, I don't want to chance it. So I just, I take precautions and I just like my wife will see me in the kitchen. I'm just spraying salt over my shoulder. And uh, the other one, if I had to pick one hockey related, yeah. I would say pregame naps, pregame naps for me were like, if I couldn't fall asleep at any given point, at least for 10 minutes, I was out like Washington well, I, I was out. It took me a while to come around and realize that it really didn't have a whole lot of bearing on the game. But anyway, that was as a player and all our crazy quirks and routines that was one of them for me do you uh, remember a teammate that was really odd or different when it came to superstitions i remember like bruce gardner when he uh, early <laughs> on had one day he was in a scoring slump so he stuck his stick in the toilet just to see and sure. apparently it helped but i'm like <laughs> is there some weird ones that you've seen i mean goalies are always going to be weird when yeah. it comes to their routines they're good dudes but really strange pregame routines and they're they're incredibly um, you know, strict with it. Like you can't get in their way. You have to stay out of their way and you never want to get in your own goalie's head because you just don't need that in your life as a player. And then otherwise, I think Chris Neal, he had a pretty wild stretch routine to the same music, to the same time. Like it had to be, he had a little stopwatch uh, or like a little, one of those little track clocks in the room that he'd walk around with around his neck and he'd have it on beat anytime he had to do his, okay, it's time to stretch. So he's doing these weird, like uh, Kegel exercises on the floor. <laughs> anyway, I won't get into it any more than that, but it, um, you see a lot of guys with different stuff. I can't believe you didn't bring this up in the episode. We're gonna have to have him back on. I now forgot. Yeah, about, I yeah. forgot. I feel bad. That's my no, bad. It's, it's all good. It just gives us more material for later. All right. Uh, <laughs> our number 13 show, though, is fantastic. We have some great guests on the show today. Nick Felino is here to talk about obviously the big trade, and I don't mean the one to the least recently, the one for you and him back in I think 2012 on July 1st where you ended up coming to Ottawa and he went to Columbus, worked out for both of you. You guys haven't really spoken about it. So we're going to delve into that. Also, Greg Carville, former Ottawa Senator, assistant coach for seven years in the nation's capital. He just won a national championship with UMass in the U S for men's hockey. We're going to bring him on to talk about that and so much more, including trivial trivia with Greg. And he's got another tidbit on Shane Pinto. We're going to get to later in the episode. All right. Now let's start with, as always, meth, the headlines. Pinto on point. Shane Pinto with a solid debut against the Montreal Canadiens. Matter of fact, Matt Murray posts his first shutout since October 2019. White in the middle of it. Should Colin White be concerned about his roster spot going into next season? Major issue for juniors. The effect COVID will have on the upcoming draft, particularly for the OHL, who has yet to play a game this season. And St. Patty's Day. Of course, Patrick Marlowe ties Gordy Howe's record for most game plays most games played with 1,767. All right, Matt, Pinto on point. What do you think of Shane Pinto's NHL debut against the Montreal Canadiens on Saturday night? It was solid. I, I really, I mean, I, I, I was really tracking him out there on the ice, looking for tendencies or anything that maybe looked a little off. And he was on point, which is pretty impressive, given that he's a, a forward getting thrown into the fire toward the end of the season like that. So, I was happy with his play. He played just shy, I believe, of 10 minutes. Yep. He was good on draws, some nice takeaways. Got his first point, which, you know, to a degree, I'm sure, um, wasn't maybe beautiful by any means or how he probably envisioned his first point happening, right? You take them but all. Exactly. Oh, no, no. And I'm not I'm not faulting. Everyone knows I'd take that point in a heartbeat <laughs> as a player. So, uh, you know, and, uh, my takeaways, though, just – as far as long-term goes and what to expect from him, you know, he's, he's just so sound defensively. He's a guy that you can rely on. It'll be interesting to see where he fits in the depth chart moving forward, going into next season. Is he going to be your second line center? Is he going to trickle down and start, start as your third line center? I have no idea, but at this point, 
All we can do is appreciate his play and what he brought yesterday. I liked that it was against Montreal on their back-to-back, and that's not to take anything away from his game, but obviously they were flat. They weren't playing with a, a ton of energy, so it's a, it was a perfect opportunity for Shane Pinto to go in, and I thought DJ managed his minutes really well too. So I and, and one more thing that I'd like to add is, you know, I think we'll get a better idea of what he can do moving forward in these next few games. And I love that it's against Vancouver. They're not playing great. They've gone, you know, been under the heat a little bit with COVID and things haven't really gone their way. But it's a great uh, opportunity for a player like Pinto to come in with a little less pressure and, and perform. OK, hold on a sec. You said he managed to DJ manage his minutes well. Everybody under the sun is wondering why he didn't play more than 10 minutes in that game. They thought well, he played very well, that he looked really good. Like, what is well, there why, to lose by letting well, why him Why did he play? look really well? He looked, well, no, he looked really well because he was managed and sheltered a little bit. And I agree. Like, I, I'd love to see him play 20 minutes. But at your first NHL game, you don't want to kill the kid's confidence, right? So you're going to give him a taste of what it's like even just being on the bench at times and he's watching the play up front like that really close. It's good for him. So um, yeah, I'm with you guys. I'm with everybody. I want to see all the young kids play 25 minutes a night. (laughs) Does that mean it's the way to do it as far as development goes? No, he'll gradually increase that ice time as they go. And it's nice when, you know, if you're at home, it's one thing you can just throw them out there and uh, you know, let them play whenever you'd like, but, but you have to control his minutes when you're on the road because you don't have the last change. Uh, and you certainly don't want them playing against all the top lines. A couple of things I've noticed. One is, and I always notice this about guys who play their first game, and, and it's something we all watch, is to see how their first couple of shifts go. Because you yeah. always see that nervous energy, right? Once he got that out of the way, he was just a regular. I, I thought he just looked like a regular NHL player for the most part. The other yeah. thing is the confidence that he gets perhaps from DJ putting him on the ice in defensive zone situations where he's taking draws, right? And I, I think yeah. that that's a huge one that perhaps gets overlooked by us because we want to see him at the other end scoring goals. But if you're in your NHL debut, and I know they're up a couple of goals, but yeah. to be put on the ice in defensive zone draw has got to feel pretty good. Yeah, it's huge. And I love that you just brought that up. And it's not just the uh, the D zone draws. It's PK time. Like, he right. was killing some penalties out there, which is great. I mean, what a, what a vote of confidence from the coaching staff to put you in that situation. So, for me, it's simple at this point. As fans or media people, whomever, we can't put too much pressure on these young kids. There's going to be some growing pains at some point. Hopefully not, uh, but but we got to expect it. So that's, again, going back to my original point, we can't expect DJ to be playing him 20 minutes out of the gate. It's gradually going to come game by game, depending on how he's playing and his confidence is, is, and where that's at. Uh, I found it funny to watch also – uh, Tim Stutzla, a couple of times the camera sh- went to the bench and he's like giving pep talks to Shane Pinto, who's actually older. <laughs> so that uh, it kind of just made me chuckle a little bit. Hey, keep yeah, it up, that's rookie. a good call. I, yeah, I forgot about that. I know this young, <laughs> this young kid giving you pointers on the bench like he's played 10 years in the league. But that's great. <laughs> that's what you want to see, right? That, that's chemistry. And um, it's certainly going to be a, a fun group to watch moving forward. Uh, Shane Pinto, the 99th player to play for the Ottawa Senators over the last four seasons as they continue to try and find the right roster spot. So speaking of one of those other guys, that's Matt Murray. In matter of fact, Matt Murray posts his first shutout since being an Ottawa Senator. We know he's gone through an awful lot to start this season. DJ Smith picks up his first shutout win as an Ottawa Senator head coach. What are your thoughts on the 23 save performance from Matt Murray? I think I was happier than just about anybody out there to see it just because I think we've been pushing for him to succeed now for the entire year. He's just, from what I understand and from interviews that we've done with people, everyone says the same thing. He's just a, he's a consummate pro. He's got a really good attitude in the dressing room and he's a likable guy. So those are the kind of players you want to see succeed. So that game against Montreal, I thought was fantastic for him. Albeit, yes, Montreal was exhausted. It looked like they were flat. I think they only had three shots in that first period. So that may have been the easiest period of Matt Murray's career. But aside from that, he still came out really big at the end. They had a couple prime chances against him. And uh, Matt Murray stood strong. He looked sharp. He was moving well. He's tracking the puck really well. That's all these things that you want to see from your starter. So for me, it's simple. I'm not going to put too much weight into it. It's just one game. But it's a nice little momentum carry from the last one, from the previous game. And I'm just hopeful that he'll carry this into the rest of the year because it'll be great for the organization uh, just to see him do well. So that kind of alleviates a little pressure going into next season. You're so typical former guy, now NHL expert, because here we are saying all the time leading up to this about Matt Murray struggling. Now he posts two good games. He's got a 948 save percentage in the two games. 
made a couple of big stuff. I mean, yes, he wasn't tested very much, but no. this has to this has to bode well for I want to say all the players and playing in front of him as well, right? Like oh, you get a different vibe when your goalie starts to play well. It's huge. It's yeah. huge because when you're not when your goalie's not going real well and and there ain't a lot of confidence there your game kind of changes a little bit and you're maybe a little more hesitant to make certain plays. And it kind of just demoralizes the group as a whole. When maybe you're in a game, you're involved, everyone's rolling really well and a couple soft goals go by them. Um, that can be tough as a player, but again, and it happens and it's to be expected to happen occasionally, but you just certainly don't want it to be a consistent thing. So, you know, again, and I'm going to keep hammering down on this. If he could just string together, it doesn't need to be wins as a team. That's fine. It's not a big deal if they lose a couple games here or there right now, obviously. But sure. if his play can be steady, if he can be playing with a little bit of confidence, despite perhaps some losses along the way, everyone's going to be happy. All right. Can you, we've, you've touched on it a couple of times here, and that is Montreal's game on Saturday and how flat they were. For a team that's trying to find its game to head into the postseason, is that I, people keep saying this emotional letdown from the Calgary win the night before? Can we not stop with this excuse and tell them they actually have to play back-to-back -back consistent games? Because this is the – like, right, we start to ramp up towards the postseason. You need to play a whole lot better. I just – I can't fathom how flat they were. Yeah, and I, I was thinking that yesterday too because remember the interview that we had with Kevin Bieksa? He was pretty adamant that they'd be a good contender or maybe a dark horse going into the postseason. And I was a, probably considered among that group as well. I had yep. high hopes for them given the – uh, the veteran leadership that they had on that in that group. And they're starting to get healthier again, too. So it's kind of a surprise. I don't really know what's going on there. I mean, I know they're an older crew, but you would think that they'd be resilient and have the proper leadership to get through these wins. And, uh, you know, I can speak from experience when I say playing a back-to-back -back is not fun. And in this particular case for Montreal, it was less than 24 hours before the game that they had played the night before. So that's got to be a huge factor. But then again, you made a really good point, Wally. There's no excuse at this point. You're trying to ramp up for the postseason. You have no choice but to get these wins. It's huge. And if you're certainly going to be considered a contender, you, you absolutely have to get these points now. Like I, I can get the not at your best game, but if you're playing sure. the worst team in that division, and I know they played Montreal well, but yeah. and you need to try and put points together and string a – like I don't think Carey Price was very good in the, at least the first two goals. I don't yeah. think – like you look at Jonathan Drouin, these guys up front who are struggling to score, they need to find something in their game to get back on track. And, and maybe I'm just, I know they've played a lot because they were shut down with COVID. They've got a tough schedule, but there just seems to be something missing in Montreal's game. And maybe well, I'm completely wrong. No, that, that could be part of it though. Before we move on, I wanted to add on that. You brought up a good point, Wally. You know, yes, they're playing at a compressed schedule and there could be an art. There's an argument to be made that, oh, it's not a big deal. Everyone's kind of facing some adversity this year. But when you've got an older group of guys like that, you don't have those fresh legs that can just bounce back the next night. It takes time. And those are the types of wins that you need your goaltending, first of all, to be your star player and steal you that game. And yeah. with, with Price right now, I, I think a lot of people, including myself, have concerns. You'd love to see him going into this final stretch with a ton of confidence, a lot like Matt Murray in many in many ways just to give the team a little morale boost. But if you're not getting the guy back there who's supposed to be driving the bus, playing some good games, you don't really stand a chance. All right, moving on. Let's go. Sure. Uh, white in the middle of it. And so you've brought up uh, <laughs> where guys are going to – Shane Pinto might play in the roster next season and whatnot. Okay. Is Colin White's role in jeopardy, perhaps, uh, going into next season? And I'll explain it because, one, they've got obviously Josh Norris – Shane Pinto, where does he fall? Tim Stutzla, does he move to center? Chris Tierney signed for another year. Colin White right now has, and this will change when Brady Kachuk signs, is has the second highest salary on, among forwards on the team at $4.75 for another four seasons. He's way overpriced for the production he brings. Is his spot in jeopardy? Could he be on the move? Because you can't keep everybody in this lineup. I, I, at least I don't think you can. No, and you certainly can't keep a guy making shy of five million dollars a year on your third pair on your third line. So, oh, there's going to be some management uh, challenges there because I don't know how you move this right now. I mean, he's not not playing incredibly well, but he's not playing poor hockey either. And he's had some challenges. I think he's had a few injuries this year yep. too. He's been playing hurt at times. It's not easy, and it's an exceptionally different season as far as it being unique with with the with the different circumstances and. I, so you bring up Pinto. I don't know how you manage this moving forward. I know it's a good problem to have, 
But if, if you're the auto centers organization, you're Pierre Dorian, what do you do with Colin White this summer? Is he still in your plans moving forward? Right now he's at about 14 points through roughly 30 games. Nothing crazy. The numbers aren't fantastic, but you're also playing on a losing team. And he's been playing with dad enough quite a bit as well, who has been struggling quite a bit, as we all know, throughout the year. So that hasn't been helpful for Colin White. Um, I like him as a player. I do think he's come a long way. He's got that gritty little style to him. He's relentless around the net. He's pretty good along the walls. Uh, but again, the situation where a good problem to have in that you have a lot of depth coming up in a player like Shane Pinto that can take on that second line role at center. But like you, like you, like you, Wally, I don't know what they do moving forward. You visit the possibility of perhaps moving him at some point this summer, but I don't know what the return's going to be. I just think his contract is too high. And that's all like, I no question I agree. He can play in the NHL, all that, but he's too expensive to be a fourth line center. And if, and I'm not even sure Shane Pinto, while we're re- heaping all this praise on him after one game is your second line center. If you do in fact move Tim Stutzla to the middle, right? So I that's so, agree. so if we move him down to Pinto to third or fourth, and because Chris Tierney's still around, who's very valuable, especially on penalty kill and whatnot, is how does Shane Pinto play? He may not even be able to last after nine games or 10. He may, right? We've seen guys come up, have really good, strong starts, and then struggle once the next season begins. He may end up back in the AHL. It looks like he's a pretty solid player. Don't get me wrong, but we've seen that happen. I just wonder, with Colin White's salary, where he fits in this roster. That's all. Yeah. And I hate, I hate, I hate even saying this because again, I, I, I really like the player and I agree with you, Wally. It's just the contract. And that's yeah. something that uh, will become probably a huge issue for him coming into next training camp, unless he starts playing lights out at some point here, it can really demonstrate um, that he belongs in that role. There's a lot of players that can kind of make him expendable at this point. And that's the, the reality. And that's something that I faced when I was in Columbus and we had drafted Ryan Murray. That was a, an opportunity for the team to move me. And in the end, it worked out well. So it's not to say that Colin White isn't an NHL player. We all agree that he is. It's just a matter of where he fits. Yeah. All right. Uh, major issue for the juniors. Now, there hasn't been a lot of talk about this, obviously, because there's so much going on with COVID and this becomes such yeah. a small, minor issue. However, we're discussing hockey. So let's talk hockey. And that is the upcoming NHL entry draft, July 23rd, 24th. There's a huge problem with the ohl players if you will because they haven't played so no one's really seen them so how do they get drafted all these players going into the nhl draft this year what happens well and i've had this discussion with some people different kind of vantage points i'd like to hear everybody's opinion and i a lot of the same stuff that i keep hearing is well mark you got to understand scouts for the most part already know who they're picking from you know previous uh looks in last year and this and that but to me I can't help but think of myself when I was in that position. I came into the OHL at 17 years old. I was never on the central scouting list and I was drafted in the sixth round. I was a late pick that kind of came out of nowhere and I ended up having a career out of it. You know, I was fortunate. So all I could think of are all the players out there right now that aren't able to come in this year in their draft year, sort of come out of nowhere and make a name for themselves and perhaps get picked. So you know, I feel for them. I don't know what the answer is because we're obviously living under, you know, wild circumstances. But the idea of perhaps, and I've heard some ideas as far as playing perhaps 20 games here, not even including a championship, a championship, excuse me, or playoff rounds, just 20 or even 10 games, kind of a weird tournament or round robin yeah. style situation where they can get some looks. But I mean, if there's no hockey, I, I just feel for all these players that perhaps will and and okay, sure, they might be eligible for the following season, but then you've got a compressed draft with a lot more bodies involved. So, I mean, I don't know what the answer is. I just feel bad for them. And I feel like it doesn't get discussed enough. And the other, the other issue too, is, and I know hockey players make a very good living and we all understand that, but if you think that you're going to go in the second round and end up in the fifth round because of all this stuff, the trend, that's, that's a lot of money, right? Like that affects greatly the income that you make. And so, there's so much that's at stake for all of these players. And you think that the Quebec league has played the WHL has played. It's the OHL that has yet to suit up. And so you wonder, is this draft going to kind of exclude those guys? If you're not in the top, as you say, perhaps one, two rounds that you already know of. Well, you would assume so certainly for all those later rounds, right? So from round, from round like three on to seven, you got to assume that you're going to see predominantly, you know, Quebec league players, Western players, and the NCAA guys. So uh, again, I guess we're focused here on the Ontario players and, and 
the problem that they're facing. And I've heard, you know, from different parents that I know who have kids playing, it's a tough scenario right now. And I, I it, it's unfortunate because again, most people won't necessarily sympathize because they just associate the players with being a sport. And it's not as important as the grand uh, scheme of things are now being COVID and being safe. And we all understand that. I have more respect for that than anything. I just know that a lot of these players have committed to playing in junior, they've they've basically eliminated any eligibility to play in CAA moving forward by getting into the OHL. So, and now they're not able to play and they're banded from playing hockey. So I just, I, I feel for them and I think it's worth more discussions because uh, there's going to be a lot of left out players. Yeah, it is something to keep a track, keep an eye on. And But of course, as we all say that there's certainly bigger issues to deal with the COVID than hockey, but for sure, uh, understand that everybody has their own things to deal with at the moment. Okay, finally, that is... Uh, St. Patty's Day. Uh, Patrick Marlowe ties Gordy Howe for the most games played in NHL history, which is crazy when you think of it. Uh, I, can, can you put into like 1,767 games? You played over 600, which is considered a lot. I think the NHL average is four and a half, five seasons. You played 13. He's at 23 for Patrick Marlowe. Like, can you put in perspective as a guy who's played what kind of milestone this is? I. I can't. I honestly can't. I like 1000 games to me is insane. It's yeah. incredible. It speaks to your durability. It's it's a very long career, as we all know, and we've seen all these players get presented. I know Backstrom just got presented his thousandth game and Lucic and they've been around forever. So imagine playing 1700 plus games in the national. I, I mean, I feel like there's a bit of luck involved. There's got to be some genetic advantage involved too. Cause in my case with the injuries that I've suffered, I mean, I should probably be around 800 yeah. and or perhaps even more, but I got hurt. You know, I, I'd have, I had knee issues. I broke my jaw. I had a bad back. And so my point is bringing myself up in this is I can't imagine playing over a thousand, let alone 70, 1700 games. It's incredible. Uh, you know, stick huge stick tap to Marlowe for that. Uh, it speaks volumes to the man that he is, the character that he has, and, and the durability that he's been able to bring to the game. Uh, it makes me wonder what kind of gift the players have to get for him when you get oh. to that kind of number, as opposed, right? Even at a <laughs> thousand games, the biggest. So have you, like, what's the, I guess, have you been around any big milestone games that you can sure. remember that really stand out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like uh, several thousand game players that I've had the fortunate uh, uh, experience to play with and, and, and be involved around that and see what it takes and let me tell you, if you're a cheap guy like myself, it's not fun because the thousandth game, the first one that came around, and I should remember which player it was, I think it was in Columbus. As a player, you have to contribute usually between a thousand to fifty to hundred dollars. And so all this money gets pulled together and you buy this player a Rolex. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar, but for those who aren't, that's the explanation. And that's generally how it works. You buy them a really nice watch or some extravagant gift. And it's deserved. And that's why I'm so conflicted because being a team guy, love the boys, love being around them, hate having to write a check. So that was always very hard. I always cringed when I knew there was a potential thousand game uh, player on the team. <laughs> so but that's part of the game. They deserve it. And, and knowing how hard it is to get there. I mean, in the end, I, I suppose it makes sense. I'd like to see the organization chip in for that more, but I guess players have to pull through. Well, it's interesting because I think it was Matt Cullen. It was one of those they just acquired in Ottawa. And I think like eight games later, he plays his thousandth game. And so yep. here's a guy you just met and now you're shelling out to get him this Rolex and, watch. And we're on the that. hook. Ah. Yeah, the new the new team's on the hook. It should be the last team that he was on. <laughs> yeah. But but it doesn't matter. It's just the way the league operates and the way the players are. And it is classy. You got to admire that for sure. And I, I do. But when you're cutting a check for someone you barely know for $1,500, uh, it can be sobering. It just see, yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure it's Matt Cullen. It was him or one of the anyway. They just show up, and now there's this big yeah. ceremony. It's oh yeah, and, and you get the big silver stick. Yeah, and, I'm like oh yeah, it's it's incredible. And and it, again, I, I sound like a terrible person or teammate when I speak like no. this. No, but I'm speaking for a lot of guys. Okay, no one likes to cut a check like that. It sucks. I'll leave it. I, at I think in every work environment, when even if you got to shell out 20 bucks to get the guy a cake who's retiring, you don't want to do that either. So <laughs> that's I, a good point. I think it all works out, right? Like, ah, oh, I yeah. got to get Johnny a cake. All right. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, those, as always, are your headlines. Uh, still to come in the show, Nick Felino stops by. 
lots of talk, obviously, about the Leafs and about Columbus and how him and Meth met after being traded for one another. Uh, also, Greg Carville. And, of course, uh, Trivial Trivia. And Craig stops by with another story on Shane Pinto. And uh, we're giving away another sauce-off kit, uh, courtesy of our good friends at gongshow.com. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Wally Mathot Show. Okay, welcome back to the show. And to now discuss one of the biggest trades of recent memory, Nick Felino. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, good to be here. Nice to see your faces. Now, the, the trade I want to talk about is clearly the one between you and Meth, because I don't think that that's ever been discussed. So uh, let's go back to clearly altered both of your careers in positive ways. So have you two ever discussed this deal? Uh, we did because one of the funniest things, I, I don't know if Matt remembers this, but we were going through a lot, well, going into a lockout that year. And, um, when I got traded for him, we kind of knew each other from Ottawa, him being around there and, uh, training there, I think. Right. And anyway, we ended up like having to go to a PA meeting in Toronto <laughs> because like, the, do you remember that? And I yeah, just I thought remember it was now. so weird because yeah. I remember getting in there and I'm like, where the hell do I sit? Like, do I sit with Ottawa or do I sit with these guys that I don't even know? Yeah. <laughs> and they don't really want to sit with me either. They want to sit with you. So we like looked at each other, like shook each other's hands. Like, Hey, this is awkward as hell, isn't it? And like, then you went and sat with Ottawa. And, like we were looking Same at thing. Yeah. Wow. You got a good memory. I actually forgot about that. It was this yeah. huge conference room and yeah. all the teams sat in like little clicks from their own yeah. respective teams. And I remember looking to him like Columbus guys. And I knew all of them obviously, <laughs> or the new auto guys. And I still remember in my mind, like Condra. I didn't even know cons, but yeah. I still have his face in my mind. I'm like, oh, I should probably go sit with con. <laughs> and and eventually we just sat our own our own ways, and that was it. Yeah. That was, that was it. Yeah. I think we yeah. got together for a few drinks after, but uh, but yeah. that was just so funny to me. Uh, like that was our kind of our moment. Normally you just see each other on the ice, but we actually had to be kind of civil and shaky. But it was, I mean, I couldn't have asked to be traded. Obviously, you had, went on and had a great career in Ottawa, and it all worked out for both sides. But pretty funny, man. Yeah, it was a good hockey trade. Yeah, like it was a straight up hockey trade, which worked out clearly for both of you. Now, Nick, were you caught off guard? Yeah, I think I was only because I, I just thought I was still so young and I didn't really know, you know, what the options were. And I thought, you know, we were a team that looked like we were trying to get younger too, with just like the way we were, we kind of were struggling and trying to find ourselves. So I thought, okay, we're going to try and bring in a new core. Um, but you know what? It ended up being the best thing that happened to me in a lot of ways. I mean, I think where I was in Ottawa, I think I realized after I was looking for a fresh start and Columbus really provided, they, they were a team that was completely tearing it down and trying to rebuild. And I got to be one of those pieces, luckily that they tried to rebuild around. And, uh, you know, and then math, obviously getting paired with Eric and just going on a tear and, you know, they were one of the best tandems in the league for a while. And uh, I think just, yeah, it, it worked out. And I, I remember just, kind of being thankful after it was a weird thing. I, I missed and loved the Ottawa Senators and my time there, but I think it springboarded me into who I am today and, and all the opportunities that I got. And I, I, you know, kind of thankful to Brian Murray for that as well. Yeah. And you, you probably knew nothing obviously about Columbus at all heading into it, right? It's like the blue jackets. What are, what, what are we doing in Columbus? And then you probably get there and realize it's a pretty good city, especially if you have a family, right? Unbelievable. And I, I'll never yeah. forget when I created my, my wife, Janelle, she's, bawling she's like where is columbus you know and, and we're, i'm like i i it's like i at ohio and so i'm like i can't even explain that to you on a map right now um but uh but man the the one guy that really solidified it for me was luke richardson because oh, yeah. i you know, i played with him in ottawa his last year in the league and um and he said nick it was one of the hardest places for me to have to leave i loved it so much he said you're gonna absolutely love it your family's gonna love it and he was right. I mean, it, again, one of the hardest places I've ever had to leave. And, uh, you know, uh, I have so many great memories. The community is amazing. The people are incredible. The organization treats you so well. And, uh, and you know, we had some success too there. That was uh, pretty special while I was there. You're going to, you're going to move. You're not going to stay there. Are you like, I'm assuming you're going to stay at your place in Sudbury or what's the deal? No, there? We're, we're talking about possibly you know, our, our lives are there now. My kids are all born there. So we're actually talking about putting some roots down if, you know, when, you know, 15 years from now when I retire. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we'll see. I mean, right now it is, it is home. I mean, it's, it's where my kids know it's where they grow up. Sudbury will always be there. And yeah. to be honest with you, it's more of a summer place anyway that we want to be here. For. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's the winters. I did enough of those in junior. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the thought, but who knows where the world will take you. That's one thing I think we've learned in the hockey world. You, you love one place and you get to the next one, you love it as much. And, but obviously Columbus will have a, a special place in my heart. The day you got traded for meth, do you know where you were? Cause meth was drinking on his balcony, uh, and yeah. celebrating with Derek Broussard. I think, where were you? I was, believe it or not, I went to my cousin's wedding in Buffalo and we had uh, some time. They were going for pictures after. So we had some time between weddings or the wedding. And my, we decided to go in my old neighborhood that we lived in when my dad was playing for the Sabres. And my, we, we pull up to our old house. And my aunt sees that the lady who owns it is gardening. So she runs out, asks the lady if we can come and take a picture from the house. Well, lo and behold, the lady's like, no, come on in. And we still go through a whole tour of my, house, my old house as kids. You know, they still had some of the stuff that like, we had our hands painted on the walls. They still had that in the basement because they never really did anything with it. Crazy. Like wow. it was a walk down memory lane, which was so neat. But what was crazy is in the excitement of getting in the house, I left my phone in the car because he's like, hurry up, you know, like run in. So we all run in. And uh, that is exactly when I got traded. I, I come out and my brother comes to me. He's like, oh, Nick, I just got a text uh, from my, I think you got traded. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, oh, I my phone. I go to my phone. I got a hundred missed calls from Brian Murray, my agent. Oh, it was a nightmare. But uh, yeah, so I'm sure they were panicking, thinking I was avoiding the phone. But no, I was yeah. really. I was. A, it was a great day that turned into a holy shit moment. So pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to have the beers. Yeah, the beers. Well, I, I was having a candidate. I, I I didn't throw a lot of parties at my house because I hated having people over and having to clean up all the time. But it was a nice day. We had a big balcony. And I found out on social media, I didn't get a call from anybody. And I'm just scanning, you know, like you just once in a while, you pull your phone out and you go through Twitter yeah. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I could see Bob McKenzie post the trade. And I'm thinking like, what? Like, and no one's called me to let me know. And that's just a sign of the times, right? Like things oh, have changed. Sure. It's crazy. Anyway. That's awesome. Yeah. It was a good time. I, Before wow. we get to the uh, trade to Toronto, will you miss the cannon? Yes. Absolutely. Cause I was always on the right side of it. So I'll miss oh, it. It's still, true. you know, what's funny every single year exhibition game at home. It still scares the hell out of me. First time it goes off, you know, we come out and I'm like, Oh, I just, I don't know why it's like, it takes a couple of, it's funny every single time. So I love it. The fans love it there. You know, Matt, like it's just, it is a cool thing you know, in, a, in a league that it's hard now to find, you know, every team seems there's almost cookie cutter a little bit in the way the league yep. is a little with how everything. So it's neat that we have this. You know, I yeah. I came from Sudbury. We had the Sudbury Wolf, the, the wolf. Feed. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe it's nostalgic for me that I see this now. We have a cannon, and uh, it was pretty cool to be a part of. I I love it. So um, yeah, it'll it'll always be there for me. Hate that cannon. Just I know everyone else. When you, when you just visit once or twice, you never you're not prepared. So. Yeah. Yeah, it scared yeah, the I, good wait, Jesus I, out of I, me. Just on Columbus, Nick, are all the guys, when I was playing there, it was like me, Jared Bull, Chris Russell, uh, Derek Broussard, Steve Mason. We all lived in the same building at Burnham Square. Is that like, so for those listening, it's a it's a, an apartment complex across from the arena. Are all really? the young guys still living in there? Yeah, so it was, <sighs> everybody went away, kind of went away. We had a little bit of an older team, so everyone was kind of suburbs, and, and like North Bank was a new nice building, and so everyone, and then all of a sudden, now this past two years, everyone's back in Burnham. It's crazy. There's so many guys. So it's yeah. funny for me because that's where we used uh, to go to hang out after games and go to those guys' houses. And yeah, so yeah it's like circle this past year. Oh, we had some good stories there. Man. I've heard. I've heard some really <laughs> good them, stories. Keep them in the vault. <laughs> Nobody's Tell listening. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm married. Wally, I'm married now. I got kids. I love my family. We're all good. We're all much we've grown up too much. <laughs> all right fine um and lastly I, lots of john tortorella is a lightning bolt figure if you will it draws a lot of criticism and whatnot but there's no way that you survive as long as you do in columbus and wear the sea without having a special relationship so what is your relationship like with torts and i and i'll throw in how, do you think patrick line can survive in columbus yeah so that's the one that always gets me. I think towards, yes, he, he can blow off the handle and he's emotional and he, and he, he cares so much and he cares so much about you. And sometimes, yeah, he can go about it the wrong way. And we've had our conversations like that where, you know, towards you gotta, you gotta approach it this way, but he, he really only knows one way because he believes it and he's seen it work. And 
I respected him so much because, you know, I got to him at a point in my career where I was coming off a really good year and, you know, I, I was, I was now being named a captain and it was like, okay, that's great. Like, good for you. But now this is what, what you need. Now this is how you get better. This is how you become a winning team. This is what is expected of you. You know, it's, it's not just good enough that you do this. I need you to do this, this, and this. So really, I think he made me a better player because he, he kept challenging me. It wasn't like, okay, Nick's got it figured out. Let's work on that. Well, no, he kept pushing me and, and challenging me to be better. And, and I like that. And that's, and you know, it's hard for some guys. I get it, but we're athletes. We're, we're, I look at it as this is an opportunity uh, in your short time. And Matthew can probably, you want to be pushed. You know, this is when you, this is the time of your life where you're trying to see what you can achieve in the career and however short or however long it is. So yeah, there's some friction sometimes, but it's always in a way that he just sees the best out of you. He, he really, you know, there's a, there's a bad stigma out there that he just, he likes to grind guys. I mean, he doesn't, if you come and, and work and, and show up and are professional, he loves you and he, and he'll give you the keys, you know, and he'll say, go. I mean, that's why he had so much respect for Artemi Panarin. You know, th those two got along great. He was a pro, he showed up and he worked. And, and I think Patty's just learning that still. He's a young guy. He's, he's a guy that has a ton of skill and his, and the game kind of probably comes easy to him. So I think now he's trying to fix the other side of him where, all right, every day it's expected of you, how you come into the rink, how you practice, how you prepare. Um, so I think Patty Line can, can survive in, in John Tortorella's world. I think Patty actually likes it and being there in the short while. I think it's just trying to figure out how to make it work. And there's some guys that have to take a little time to adjust. And I did. I mean, he challenged me my first year. He talks about it all the time. He didn't think I could be captain. I struggled under towards that first year just because I was trying to find my way and him pushing and grinding. And uh, But then you kind of you get some confidence when you – realize the message and you start to gain some traction and then oh man you all of a sudden now you're confident in your abilities and and I think you as a player just become so much better so that's why I think Torch is one of the best coaches I've had is just that he he's never going to stop pushing you but in a way that it, you do know he cares about you you know and I think that's all you can ask for as a player okay let's move on to uh your new <laughs> career if you will and that is being a member of the blue and white and uh, there's lots of history. We know that your dad played there and, and you're from Sudbury. And so the Ontario boy and all that, like, can you, I know you've been asked this probably, can you sum up your initial reaction to going to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs? <sighs> you know, I didn't expect it to be as uh, excited as I was, you know, just, just because of all the emotion I had with leaving Columbus, you know, it was, a, it was a, a weird, you know, especially for me, I, I'm the captain of the team. I felt responsible for the position that we were in, you know? And, and so you feel almost guilty at first about having an opportunity to go play with a really good team. And, you know, you're leaving your guys and th these are guys I've battled with and, and I've tried to get to, to push and lead and, and, you know, and, and fight with me. So uh, I think I had like a little bit of moment there, but then when I made the decision and, and we were able to come to an agreement and it worked out for Yarmo as well. I mean, it ended up being the right offer and the best offer and, um, but when I said it, I, you know, that phone call that I made to my dad and how excited he was for me, I think not even that I was playing in Toronto, just that I had a chance to go play in the playoffs, knowing that this is 14 years in the league now, how many more chances and, and, you know, hopefully it's a long time, but you never know. Right. And so I think he was really excited for that, but then all that, that came into it that he played, you know, I'm wearing his number. Well, it's my number. I say now I've been in the league 14 years. So my number, <laughs> um, but that whole emotion that went into it is just, I think it was really overwhelmed. And also I remember being a kid cheering for the Leafs. I watched with my dad, the 93 series. I remember the passion the fans had. So all that kind of came back and, and the emotions of all that came through. And I am, I feel rejuvenated. I feel excited. I am like a little kid right now. I cannot wait to get around those guys. You know, it's, it's how I kind of felt going to Columbus. It's how I felt coming to Ottawa it's that little jump in your step again. And I'm just so excited to be around, around the guys and, and some, obviously some great players. And you're still younger than half of them. Cause it's Joe Thornton, Jason Spezza, right? Like <laughs> it's true. The great have you, feeling. The have you great reached feeling. out to, to Spets to, to talk oh, yeah. about, you know, I mean, obviously absolutely. your teammates in Ottawa. Yeah, absolutely. I, I reached out to him and said, it just feels so good not to be the oldest guy on the team anymore. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that just says how young we were in Columbus. I don't know. But uh, but I'm really excited to play, obviously, with Spez, uh, with Joe Thornton. You know, you just he's a legend of the game. Uh, you know, and, and then even just John Tavares, you know, obviously respect him from afar and all he's done and gotten to know him a little bit over the years and 
played with Austin Matthews, uh, the world championships and for the U S team, uh, Mitch Marner, obviously an unbelievable talent. You know, the list goes on. You keep talking. And then the other guys, you know, Wayne Simmons, I always battled against him. We had epic battles. We had never fought, but just competed so hard against each other, him and Philly, myself and Columbus. Um, so a guy that I have a ton of respect for and their whole team, you know, their, their back end, uh, you know, I hated playing against Muzzin all those, all these years, a hard nosed guy. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting around that group. And I said, like learning from these guys, you know, that's, I think part of being a good athlete is trying to learn as much as you can from everybody, whether young or older, uh, you know, I have an opportunity to learn from some pretty great players and, and help a team and, and come in and just, and just be myself. Have you, have you had conversations? I'm assuming you've obviously had conversations with the coaching staff. What's, what are they expecting? What's the role going to be like for you? You know, I think kind of a little bit of everything, wherever I'm needed. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a kind of preliminary talks. They're, they're obviously still kind of going here. I think in yeah. the next day so I'll, I'll have more conversations. They play back to backs. And um, so as I get closer, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more, but yeah, I think they're just coming and expecting me to bring what I bring. And that's just, you know, wherever I'm needed. I, I kind of, I like that. I like that environment. I like that, that role um, where if you need me in this kind of a spot tonight, I'll do it. And if you, and especially knowing how good this team is, I'm not coming in there and thinking I'm owed something or I need a spot and this is where I'm going to play. I usually just let my play dictate that anyway and try to at least. So, um, and I think that's also the best way to earn guys trust. You know, yeah. if, if you're just coming, handed the keys sometimes it can rustle feathers and I've seen it with guys coming on our team you gotta earn it you gotta earn it so I'm, I'm hoping to come in there and do that and hope the guys know that and um and I'll make sure that's known when I get in there and just have a lot of fun with the group yeah and that's that's got to be fun too right like you're not a, you're not the captain right now you're kind of going in there just to help out I mean obviously you're going to provide I'm sure a lot more than that but I think your mindset's just a little more easy going now right I mean it's a high pressure situation yet you can just go and have fun with it and contribute wherever you can for sure. I think that's something I, I'm, I'm going to enjoy more than I expect right now. You know, obviously with Columbus, a lot of the questions and, you know, what's wrong with it, you're answering, you know, it's, it's always on your shoulders. Exactly. Love that responsibility. And I still think I'll probably have that mindset, but, you know, be able to be in a support uh, aspect too, for a lot of the guys that, you know, are the big minute players or the guys that have been there. And, and if I can offer anything, it's, it's that kind of a mindset to help us through anything that we're going to go through. So Absolutely. Like you said, I think I'm really excited about just going in there, being who I need to be and nothing more, no real added pressure other than playing in Toronto. And I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. Which is a lot of pressure. I, I think yeah, it is yeah. right. Like there's no team under the microscope more than probably the Toronto Maple yeah. Leafs. You've, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I've only played the most you played in the playoff years, I think 10 games. So you, you come in now, you're an automatic Stanley cup contending team and has a chance literally to, to win a Stanley cup and you brought it up earlier you appreciate the the opportunity that's in front of you now that 14 years in that this could be your chance to here to make it to a cup final absolutely i yeah i i took me what is it 11 years or 12 years to get to first round win yeah. so i don't take anything for granted i also don't you know i don't think it's a reflection of of the teams i was on i think it's just that's how hard it is to win and I've realized that over the years and it, it takes everybody and Matthew, you've been a part of it. You know, it takes, it takes unsung heroes. It takes the guys who are looked to, to, to drive it, to continue to do so. And everybody is so important and every role and it, it, you have to be so selfless that time of year and you have to grind and you have to, you know, there's so much that goes into it. Cause yeah. you know, I've been the team that upsets a team like we did against Tampa and you know, we did it purely on grit and determination and defensive play. And, you know, then they go out and, and add some of that. And all of a sudden now they're there. You can't stop them. Um, so I'm hoping to provide that. I'm hoping to get, you know, this, this opportunity, I, I don't want to waste. I, I want to, you know, make it, make the most of it because first of all, I appreciate the team and, and going out and, and acquiring me. That, that's something that means a lot to me. Uh, you know, they took a chance on me. They wanted to bring me in. I don't take that for granted one second, the, the, you know, to, to be able to bring, I know what it's like to bring somebody into the fold. You have to really know if they're going to click and how important that is. Um, so I, I take that seriously and I want to make the most of it for those guys. You know, there's a lot of us in there that have never won and it would be amazing to, to band together and help the, the younger guys in there with the older guys who have some of the experience to, to go on a pretty, pretty fun run. So I think that's the motivation. That's the determination I have right now going into Toronto. 
I know you've been asked about the goal or your dad's leap and whether you do it in Toronto <laughs> or not. And, and I know you're not wearing the bucket clearly, but do you, I think you've got to do it as a guy. I covered your first NHL goal. I'll never forget it when you did the leap. And, yeah. and I, I think you have to do it so that they can take and put edit the two photos side by side. I think it'd be fantastic to have on the yeah. kitchen fridge. Well, you know, like, should I do it for an overtime winner? Or do I got to do it? <laughs> no, you know, like, I don't care what goal it is. You'll be empty right. netter for all I care. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not wearing the uh, helmet. I tell you that right now. I'm not wearing that helmet. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, you know what? We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what the emotions get me. I don't know if it's, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I'm just going to leave it at that. We'll, okay. we'll let my. It's a smart answer. Moment. That's what I did in Ottawa. In the moment, I went with it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to go back to that goal for a second. I don't know the last time you watched it, but there is a little hop when you first score and then you do the leap. And I'm curious if you like, oh, I just scored. I better do the leap. Like what's going through your mind? And clearly it's a split second, but do you yeah. remember that? Uh, you know, I do remember. Well, first of all, I remember that I had a wide open net before I went for a wraparound. That was the best part. If you watch it, I like to go carry price is done and out. And I, I could have just backhanded in, but I decided to take it around the net and wrap around. <laughs> and I think coming off the wrap around, I was so excited. So I probably jumped up, but then I realized because well before that though the guys all said if you don't if you don't jump we're gonna find you you know like that was like i had danny wow. heatley and jason sped like they're like listen you have to do the jump <laughs> so i was like well i don't have any money i'm a rookie uh, yeah okay i'll do the jump you know <laughs> so uh, so that was kind of already in the back of my head and i think i was just so excited and it worked out great and uh pretty special moment man it was an unbelievable feeling uh one other thing with the ottawa senators were you were you, you must've been teammates with Boro, right? Mark Borowiecki at some point or no? Yeah. Like just briefly, he was kind of up and down and up and down. Okay. So why did you fight him back in February? Uh, we, our team wasn't playing well and Boro was always a gamer. So I just said, he actually said, uh, I think I said to him, should we do one? He's like, if you want to, or something like that. And I said, all right. So you, so, you engaged him. I think. Yeah. Or we, we kind of looked at, no, he, you know what he said? I looked at him. And I think he could tell what I was thinking. He goes, should we? And I said, yes. And then we went at it. And uh, he's a tough, tough customer, man. Yeah, no kidding. I don't know, why, like, I, I don't know why you do that. Because you're skilled enough man. that you don't need to. Obviously, it runs in the genes a little bit. But still, it's so impressive that you can just go out and play a guy like Borrow just like that. But anyway, good on you. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, Boro, Boro was uh he got actually it was funny he got, got me in a headlock and he started throwing lefts or rights at me and it, it hit my visor thank god I was laughing because it was like <laughs> four in the visor or that one that could have been pretty ugly um, I, was, I, was, I was just gonna ask you that because you, you tap your head or something as you guys are skating to the box and then there's a there's a few words exchanged but it doesn't look heated so I was just curious no. what was said well, it's kind of like fight like he was the young guy I mean he's, he's older now but it was just like you know he's a young guy that I always kind of respected because you know, if you know, if you watch Boro, he's had to work for everything in the yeah. NHL. Like he's not the most skilled guy, but he is a heart and soul, passionate, like in your face. You just don't like playing against him. So uh, I was just kind of laughing that you know here I am playing, uh, fighting this kid that I saw kind of come up in the league, and uh, you know we, I think we have mutual respect for each other. So uh, great guy, and obviously what he does in the community, you you like those guys. So it's kind of funny to fight, but yeah, we had a good laugh in the penalty box about it. Normally I don't. Normally I'm I'm want to kill the penalty box, but uh, Boro is just one of those guys. Afterwards, you kind of you kind of laugh it off. So yeah. uh, better, than I, fighting, I, better than fighting Reeves all those years ago. That was yeah. That was, <laughs> well, I, I'm going through your list of guys you fought, and I'm like, you're no heavyweight. All due respect, and I look at thanks, the list. It's a lot. Right? I'm like, like Meth is easily bigger than you now. That he works out every day. Is uh, he's his yeah. bicep like my quads. Let's stay on. Let's stay on the topic here, okay? <laughs> you never shied away from anybody. It seemed like when I look at your list of hockey fights, stupidly, stupidly. No, you know what? I, I as weird as it sounds, I kind of like it. It's fun. It's uh, it gets me in the game. It gets guys in the game. It's I don't know. It's I think it's necessary. Like I don't like fighting when there's no point. You know, I, I and I say that I think there's always a point of fighting, but you know what I mean when there's just yep. yeah the stage there's stuff. nothing. To gain, there's nothing to gain from it, then that's just not me. It's not who I am. But if I feel our yeah. team needs it, or I need it. Uh, I'm not playing well. Sometimes it snaps me out of a funk, and 
but yeah, I try to do it that way, but let's, yeah, I, I definitely, like you said, Matt, I like scoring goals a lot more. <laughs> do your kids mind if you fight? Cause they're now uh, old enough to know. Daughter, my daughter hates it. So she no. was balling. She was, they were actually at that game. It was like, Oh first, no. One of the first games the fans could come to. Uh, and so they're at that game and she's bawling and like freaking out and, Next day, like making sure I got no bruises on my face. And, uh, but my boys love it. They think it's hilarious. And my wife thinks that's awful because now they fight each other in the house. You know? so <laughs> dad, you know, I'm like, oh, God. So you can't win. You just can't win. Yeah. With what kids. kind of example are you setting? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but my wife just, your- she likes it as long as I win, she says. As long as you win, I don't mind it. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's <pretty> easy. <laughs> I don't it's- know what constitutes a win. Surviving is what I think is Surviving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you just brought up your daughter, Melania. I, we'll ask how she's doing and also your son. I know you, you've gone through some medical issues with them in the past. And you've been very open about it. And so, uh, is there, I mean, I believe you said everybody is good and everybody's healthy. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking. No, everyone's doing great. Uh, Milana's doing, uh, she's seven years old now oh my God. and uh, feeling great. Obviously went through a, a scary, uh, you know, a couple of years ago now, um, you know, with her heart and, she got an infection. It's kind of the worry we have with the valve that she's had put in since she was a baby uh, that it can get infected. So she had an infection and caused us to have another open heart surgery kind of unexpectedly, but it's the life we live with her. Um, so, you know, she's, she's incredibly strong and got through it. And, you know, that's why with all the things we've done for hospitals and we just, we, we feel so fortunate and, and so lucky and blessed to come across the people we've come across and who have given us a chance to have a family or saved a family member and, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just great to see, um, you know, our, our kids doing well, but also being able to, to do something good out of it. So my son's doing well. It was, it was also a scary moment, but he's, he sounded like terrible parents when you start talking about it. No, um, not at all. Uh, but no, that, that, you know, everyone's doing really well. And I think that's, that's kind of why Janelle and I are the way we are. We just, we realize, you know, like I said, how fortunate you are in this position that we're in too, that we also go through something scary but then we have a reach that we can get to people and say, Hey, this is what's going on. You know, not to put light on There's never a woe is me. We're, we're, we're very fortunate. We've gotten through everything, but Hey, if you're going through something similar, there's these doctors, there's these facilities, there's these hospitals, there's, you know, that's, I kind of feel like our duty after you get through it to try to help. And uh, so we try to just turn anything bad into a good. And um, it's just great to see our kids doing well. Yeah, because I and I know you've donated over a million dollars to hospitals, and I think you've done fantastic work to try and raise awareness. Um, I will say, I go back to that, and I know that day. I think December thirtieth is when you announced to the team you were taking a leave of absence. Yeah. And I and I've tried to find the video of it again because I'm sure I think I've seen it. Is how emotional that moment was on the ice. Can you oh. try to explain it? Yeah, that was tough. Uh, you know, I knew the day was coming. I kind of kept it quiet around the guys just because I probably would have been a wreck kind of just, you know, you're nervous. It's you're heading into an open heart surgery for your daughter. You don't know how it's going to go. And, uh, and those guys, you know, that's probably why I have such a strong bond with Columbus. I got to be around some really special guys in that room. I mean, the character and people and, and, and that on that team, um, I just have so many great things to say about guys and, and just so humbled by, by their you know friendships and, you know, how, how they were able to, to, make my family feel going through something. So I think when I had to announce that I was leaving and they all gave me a big hug on the ice, uh, I, I was, I had to run, I think I had to rush off the ice cause I was pretty emotional. Um, but just knowing that they were in our corner and they have been ever since, uh, you can't ask for anything better. You know, you got your family support then to have your second family support with your hockey team and your organization and Columbus was outstanding all the way through. Um, you know, I owe them everything. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, I'd, your brother Marcus plays in Minnesota. I believe the f- your family may be cheering more for him than for you. Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, my son's Mar- Marcus is a, a jerk. Uh, this, <laughs> this Christmas, he's like, "Hey, I got something I'm coming for the kids." I'm like, "Oh, that's nice, Christmas present." Finally, you're gonna send. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and uh, he ends up sending him like two warrior hockey sticks, like one piece, brand new, like nicer than what I use. And then Minnesota wild gloves with their names on them and nice. like all the, like this whole. And so my boys are like, Oh man, uncle Moose is the best. Like we love, he's the best player. They're using it on the house. They're using it. They're taking it. 
in like, you know, he's got a Columbus Blue Jackets jersey, but Minnesota Wild gloves on, on the ice, you know? And I'm like, oh, God. Everyone's like, is he a little confused? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but pretty, pretty cute. And I mean, I think, honestly, they do love Uncle Moose more than, more than Dad. But uh, I'll swing him back in my favor here soon. A little more, a couple more trips to the ice cream shop. I, I did watch the video of you taking them for ice cream, which is very entertaining. Um, <laughs> did, they, did they ever sp- – Dr- spill any ice cream in the car because the threat oh. was if you spilled ice cream you had to walk home yeah and by yeah. the way the kids are in car seats so it would be a long walk <laughs> yeah uh, i'd probably get child services called on me um but yeah no, they uh they they actually are pretty good in the car i'll give them credit i usually throw a bowl you know they get the cone but then i throw the bowl in. it's it's things you've learned over time as being a parent um mm-hmm. but yeah, they, they know that dad's a bit of a neat freak. I, I laugh because my car, it's like spotless. You know, like I, I'm crazy. I probably have OCD about just that. And my wife's car is food everywhere. And yes. And I just, I get in it and I'm like, ugh, like it just grows. <laughs> and then she just, she'll just proceed to yell at me, like, well, this is what life is like when I'm taking them all over the place. I don't have time. Yeah. I don't care. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, I don't blame you. So I'm going to have to show wife, my wife this clip. We literally just had this <laughs> argument the other day. I'm not even kidding. So yeah. this is perfect. I'm, I'm going to cut, cut, cut it. Yeah. <laughs> they are rock stars. I'll give them credit. Uh, yeah. I don't give them enough sure. credit. She is a rock star. And I don't, yeah, I don't know how she does it. Uh, I'm just going to get out of there because before all of us get into trouble is <laughs> yeah. are they well, now, go, are they now going to like, are you going to introduce them to Austin Matthews? Is that the guy that may swing them back into your favor? Well, you know, who's swinging us back into favor is uh, I might've mentioned Austin Matthews is friends with Justin Bieber. And that's a big deal to my daughter. So <laughs> she's a big uh, Haley Bieber, I believe. Right. Haley's his wife's name. Yep. Yeah, so he really likes her. My boys really like Justin Bieber's music. Um, so I'm hoping that this show will give me a plug that Justin Bieber will reach out to me. And <laughs> I it. doubt it. Yeah, I highly doubt it. No, this show is <laughs> not, huge. Not it's huge. Uh, Beeps, Beeps but... never misses an episode. He's a he's a huge <laughs> fan though, eh? Like I saw a clip of him the other day on his tour yeah. bus or something, and he's watching a game, like a like a Toronto game. So you got it. You got a good chance. Yeah, like, I, well, I forgot, too. I didn't really realize, but I knew Austin a little bit, and I knew he was friends with them. Uh, yeah. Um, so I just laughed. My kids, actually, my daughter brought it up, because I think they saw him do, like, a video for the Leafs, because um, they watch all that, like, YouTube. Yeah. Anyway, they saw a video yeah. that he did with the Leafs, and so she's like, they knew that he was a Leaf fan, so they brought it up, and I was laughing. I'm like, <laughs> not even a player. It's Justin Bieber that gets them to love the Leafs, you know? So, hey, whatever, as long as they're whatever, cheering. Whatever it takes. Uh, uh, you may have a chance, and I don't know how your contract's going to play out. We don't have to discuss what the future is, but um, you have a chance of playing a thousand games very soon in the next season. Um, and I know players don't like to discuss upcoming milestones too much, but what's it mean to get close to that? I think you're going to be the fifth player of your draft class, uh, and your dad played a thousand eighteen. Are you hoping like you're going to go by him? Is that a, is, is that the, <laughs> is that the milestone? Absolutely. I think I told him that like naively a long time ago. Like I'm going to be, I saw you. It's, I thought I was going to be just 700 and something points, but I got a little work to do. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, his, his 1018, I always thought was, cause I think he has this silver stick at home. So I think that was always just so cool to my brother and I, how heavy it was. And that, you know, we were on the ice for the celebration in Florida. And um, so it always something that stood out in a, in a career. And I think it is a great Testament to a career. I mean, you gotta, Beautiful. you gotta stay healthy. Yeah. yeah, like it's, it's so to be even close to it is a pretty cool feeling. And knock on wood, I can get there. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was really like even seeing Lucic uh, the other night. He just got his thousandth, and seeing my draft class, it's kind of starting to hit me a little bit more. That you know, I think Backstrom's due for uh, yep. for his yep. tomorrow. So it's um, yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing that, uh, and I'm really proud of it. I, I think it's you know, I'm, I'm proud that I've been able to. Uh, we always said that old cliche. It's one thing to make the league. It's another thing to stay, you know, cause you got always every year, somebody's trying to take your job. Um, yeah. So hopefully I can, hopefully I can suppress a few more guys and, and stay in the league. <laughs> well, my friend, like Ray Ferraro, I think put it best. Who's a guy who played in the NHL, as you know, he said, it's not like the point totals. It's the fact of playing a thousand games because someone has to ask you to come back and to keep coming <laughs> back to play. Yeah. Right. Like, you have to be given the opportunity to get those point totals. You have to get on the ice. And I think that 
is what the the thousand games means so much for is to be able to be asked to play in the NHL. For sure. To stay relevant, right? To stay, yeah. uh, you're bringing something for a thousand games that nobody else can bring. They, they value what you bring so much. I think that's such a testament to any player and any guy, that, you know what, let's be honest, to play in the NHL is hard. I mean, yeah. to any guy that ever gets a chance to play, you've done something right that somebody values. And, uh, but then you look at the guys who get the thousand games or the, the thousand points in a thousand games. I was lucky enough to watch Alf get a thousand points in a thousand games through a hat trick uh, in Buffalo. And I just, you know, talk about consistency, you know, and having players like that around where, you know, to be that effective in that many games uh, is incredible. So, um, you know, I'm, I, yeah, like I said, it'd be an amazing feeling to join this company and uh, we'll see where it goes. Hopefully. Uh, one thing we haven't discussed, and I think maybe a, a highlight for you, is the All-Star Game in Columbus. Would that be up there for you? Yeah, that was that was unexpected. Just a lot of – that whole year, you know, just everything kind of clicked for me as a player. And I remember having a conversation before that year uh, with Dan Hynote. He was really influential for me um, as assistant coach. And he said, before I left that summer, he's like, you got to decide what kind of player you want to be. He said, like, if you want to be the guy that, you know – can, you'll be, you'll kind of bump along and you'll have that impact or you can take it to another level. And he said that that's what we expect out of you. And that's what we see for you, but you got to start seeing that for yourself. And, you know, I think those words just motivated me that summer and having to come into that year and it ended up being a contract year, which I didn't really care about. I think it just all lined out, but uh, yeah. And, and just be able to have that experience start off really well and then be asked to captain, not, not even make the all-star team, which I was already nervous as hell about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then to be captain of the team uh, was, was I was, you know, at the time, so nervous. That, for me, was more nerve-wracking than any other thing, just because you're, you're kind of on display and you're kind of showing off your city and your team and uh, you want to have a good showing. But then I just got to relax and have a ton of fun. And the guys made it so much fun being around them and, uh, well, it was, it was, a well, we actually ruined the draft. They never did a draft after that. Cause there was a lot, there was something to be said about what was in the solo cups and that I never forget. To, <laughs> that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm getting at here because I'm interviewing you. And I, I think we spoke every day for like three straight days. And I'm like, Nick Felino is enjoying this all-star game more than anybody else. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, there might have been a little something in those drinks, but <laughs> I've never forgotten yeah. it. I'll never. Ovi was on fire that night too. He kept saying like he didn't want to get drafted or uh, yeah picked by anybody, and uh, yeah, we we ended up trading. I think Phil Kessel for somebody for Tyler Sagan. Did we do that? It sounds right. So, yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I just I, I think what I loved about it was just the chance to show off the city because now I had been there for a while, and Matthew can attest to this. Like it is a really undercover hockey town they, they really awesome. love it. yeah they do like the playoffs every year is insane like i've never i seriously can't imagine some other places that have the fans that we have they stand the whole they were standing the, the whole time it's crazy my wife like, all my family comes like i hate it actually because you have to stand and <laughs> everybody in it but it's amazing to play in you know and we, yeah. it, it's incredible that atmosphere that they they create and so to be able to kind of show that off and, and have it be sold out and, and uh, they did like a winter carnival outside. It was, it was really cool to be a part of and it's something I'll remember forever. And it's got, it's, I don't, I don't want to beat a dead horse down on Columbus because we keep pumping its tires, but the setup is just perfect, right? If you're a player, you got the oh. practice rink, it's attached there. Like when you're in Ottawa and you have oh. to practice at the Senseplex in February and your feet are frozen, like, like Eric and I would go through the old bins. Your on, you're driving. Yeah, man. We would find these old, like Alexa Yash and turtlenecks just to and I'd pull them all the way up. And the practice is a joke because, like, you're just looking forward to getting back to the rink, right? But in Columbus, great setup, practice yeah. rinks attached. The, the downtown area is great. It's not too busy. It's easy to get around. Like, yeah. it's such a great undercover city for free agents. And I yeah. feel like the secret's starting to finally get out. Yeah, I hope so. Because, I mean, even that short north, you should see it now from when even three years ago. Like, it's oh, blown up. I can't up. imagine. Yeah, it's blown up. And so, yeah, it's it's one of those cities that I don't think gets enough credit because, you know, just for whatever reason. It's, but I, like you said, I think it is starting to get its, it's due and guys are really yeah. starting to see how great it is, especially, you know, the raising the family is one thing, but the downtowns really come to life again. So yeah, it's awesome. It's just good for the – that's good for the younger free agents. So that's Yeah. Yeah. 
Do you two have a favorite place in Columbus? I wonder if it's the same one all these Ooh. years later with Nick. So many new restaurants. So, uh, Meth, where did you hang out? I have one. I have one. Uh, me and, and, and I introduced it to Bobby Ryan when I was in Ottawa and he fell in love with it too. And it was like a shady little spot. It's called, uh, it's in German village and it was called Lindy's. Oh, great spot. Yeah, nice it's a good spot. restaurant, right? You know, I, I could name bars, but that was a yeah. good restaurant that I could think no, of. No, that was a great, it's, it's one of our favorite places um, to go. And you get all the brick roads, like that area. Yeah. It's just yeah. nice. It's, it's different. It's a really cool vibe, actually, in the German village. Yeah. It's a cool spot. Yeah. Um, I'd probably say, uh, man, this is hard, actually, for me. Did, was sushi, did, do you remember Sushi Rock? The bar slash lounge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, no I DJed. I DJed there a couple of nights, and I was absolutely shit faced. <laughs> I have, I have no doubt about that. Mid season. DJ. No doubt about that. Yeah. <laughs> bar twenty three yeah. still there, so that's good. Yeah, yeah bar um, twenty three. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, no, but I think for me, I would probably say, uh, well, Cameron Mitchell's a big re restaurant tour there, and yeah, uh, it's a good spot. Yeah, there's a place called the Pearl that I really like. It's like more of an oyster seafood house um that i i've really come to love for it's been there for a while so i'll say that can we just stop glossing over the fact that meth is djing for a second yeah um, no. i would have loved to have been there meth i would have paid i would have paid to get in there no you back? would not have you would not have loved it it was <laughs> really weird scene it was really <laughs> is this a paying I, gig uh, i was just spinning the ones and twos no you had me up there and it was <laughs> <laughs> and there's like and there's like music videos so like it was like a weird system where i pick a song and they play me and then i would like gravitate towards one genre and he'd be like dude start mixing it up more like play other yeah. stuff and i'd play other stuff and i just for i, I thought i was armin van buren for an evening it was amazing i yeah. loved it I, like i thought it was tiesto you know that's i love it living yeah. the dream you want to, I have one. I have one Mark Mathot story that I'll, I'll share with. Uh, oh, with yes. It's not uh, bad, but it's Mark Mathot's return to Columbus, and I'll never forget this because everyone knows Meth was known for that stupid hip check that he would throw. Uh, on <laughs> right, and so we even we even said it before the game, right? Because everyone knows you are all like, okay, Meth's gonna try and throw a hip check and just watch your knees. You know, he's an idiot, and. Uh, <laughs> Sure enough, I'm coming down. I come down and boom, he hits me. The guy that got traded and Meth's like playing with Eric Carlson. They're talking about Team Canada, you know, and I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out. And this asshole, no, I don't know if I can say that. on. Yeah, I can say what but, I do. No, but I was just laughing. I'm like, how that timed out perfectly. I'm like, the one guy that. Well, I just and you, but you were good about it I because after, after the like, game. Yeah. We talked after the game. I ran into you in the hallway and you were cool. It's funny you just brought that up. I actually totally yeah. forgot about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, just laugh at that one that I got absolutely smoked by a Mark Mathot you know, hip check. One of many. The, the part one of that of story many. that is most flattering to me is the fact that you guys were talking at a, about it beforehand. They, so well, that's cool. I think it was on the sheet. You know, the sheet that they talk, you know, everyone there's, is like, watch out for hip check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So did he get a I, penalty? I, I can't remember. Came, no, 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 it was clean. Very clean. Was clean. Very, clean yeah. very nice. And a clean hip check doesn't yeah. typically hurt all the time. It's more no. just embarrassing. You know oh, what I mean? It's like, embarrassing. Yeah. You, and you, you can't know. get out of the way of it. That's the worst part. That's when, <laughs> when, when you try to get out of the way, that's when bad stuff happens. You just hundred percent. The best you thing you can do is cap, just like, stop. The best thing you can do is just stop. Like don't yeah. move. But everybody always like elongates their body and try to move. <laughs> and that's when you're prime. Cause I can scoop. <laughs> Yeah, uh, hey, I, this is, that yeah. came to me just now, and I wanted to make a point of that because that one made me laugh. I was just like, "Son of a gun!" So nicely done, man. Nicely done. So when you came back to the bench, did anybody say anything to oh, you? Oh yeah, guys were like, "Watch out for the hip check." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's it. awesome. Yeah, so that was good. All right, good memories. So, yeah. Meth, what do you remember other than that throw that hit? going back and playing. I thought I was worried. I'm not going to lie. I'll, I'll just be honest. I, I, I was worried that he was going to fight me. Like all I could think was like, cause I know because at the time I knew Nick, like I knew, I knew the player like really well. I knew he could fight too. And I'm thinking like, ah, oh, like, am I going to have to drop them? You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and I don't like to fight if I'm not angry. Like I have to be mad at somebody to actually fight. Whereas some lunatics like Nick Felino could just fight to get themselves back into a game. 
I, my approach yeah. was a lot different. So all I could think was like, okay, I just hit him and I'm looking like the quarter mile, like, where, where is he right now? And then, but you let it go. And I was like, oh, thank hey, God. <laughs> clean hit, clean hit. You got to tip your yeah. cap. And so I said, yeah. get mad. And I was just laughing. I'm like, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. Uh, uh, so I was good. Yeah. We'll have to we'll have to have Craig bring that into the show. I think at some point. Oh yeah, Maybe I think it's out there. It's got to be out there somewhere. Yeah. No, it is. It is. Yeah. Who won that right. game? I don't even remember. I think I we, won. Yeah. we won. Yeah. We, we we it was a close game though. Like it was a one goal game. Yeah, was I it weird? So. Like because the two of you are. Do you always have that? I'll say bond because the two of you were traded for each other. Well, I just think. Really. I, I just knew him before and I knew he was a great guy. Yeah, so. like 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 when I would see him, I knew that that was the guy that I was traded for, but we never really it was not like that. No. Plus, now uh, you know, Columbus, Ottawa, you didn't play against each other a ton. Yeah. And, no, you know, it is what that it was, is. Yeah, no, exactly. It's almost back. I don't, know how to, I don't know, like Wally's like looking for something here, and I can't. No, I just curious that you <laughs> no, always mutual know respect, you... Wally. Mutual respect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um I'm just because you, the way that trade happened to Toronto and San Jose is now picking up part of your salary. Are you going to get a San Jose Jersey? Well, I just, I was expecting a text from Eric to say, welcome to the team, but he never texted. me. <laughs> so I don't know what happened, but uh, yeah, I was crazy. I, that's the part that blows me away now with the way the league's gone. Like the, the guys that have to figure that stuff out now with the salary cap. Oh, I mean, crazy. straight money. Every team's got a money ball. It's just crazy to me how that works and, you know, that's how they, they get around it. So I'm thankful. I mean, it gave me an opportunity to go play and, um, you know, I'm really excited about what's coming down the pipeline here in, in about five more days. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite NHL hockey moment? Oh, God. Wow. Do you have one? Well, I got a few, but uh, – well, I well one I was actually at the Detroit Red Wings Colorado Avalanche massive brawl after. Oh, you were there? I was there. My dad was coaching the team at the time. It was his first year, so we stayed back in Buffalo. And uh, I remember my uncle. Uh, well, I would call him Uncle Larry Playfair, a former tough guy in the league. Uh, my dad and him became such close friends that we called him Uncle all the way through. Him. So he took us to the game. And lo and behold, it ended up being the craziest game I've ever witnessed in my life. <laughs> and so it's just like, it's so funny because that still gets rerun that game all the time after, you know, the uh, the Mew hits Draper. And it's a wild so that was game. Like a retribution game. So I was there for that, which was an eye opener. Um, I saw some epic, epic things in Hershey when my dad was the coach of the Hershey Bears, just some of the wildest fights and games and, um, but probably the coolest hockey experience for me was I actually got lucky enough to be at the Stanley cup game for the Colorado Lynch in 2001. Uh, my dad was the farm team coach for Hershey and, uh, he gave us an opportunity to, to come and watch the game, my brother and I, and my mom. So we, we flew in for the game and they ended up winning against the devils and, uh, what an experience just to, to witness that as a young kid, you know, with no real understanding if I was ever going to play to have a kind of, I was in the locker room. I was behind the scenes, like the way they wow. treated. Yeah. I was spoiled, you know? So, uh, I'm, yeah, that's probably what sticks out most in my head, just from a fan perspective, obviously there's personal stuff, but to me, that was, you know, we're all fans of the game to start off with. So that was, that was pretty impressive and special to see. Interesting. Okay. So players have a superstition, if you will, to not touch the cup. So have you touched the Stanley cup, uh, any time in, so- yeah, I did because, I mean, I also say, I think it's different. Like, if you're young and you're a fan, why wouldn't you? I think of it's course. when you start playing in the league, then you don't touch it. That's my always is like it, when I'm a kid. What am I? How do I know if I'm ever going to come around this thing? I didn't know I was going to play in the NHL, so can't blame a kid. Um, nope. But yeah, that's my thing. I, I so I did, did touch it. I, there's a picture of me and my brother and my dad holding it up. And it's, it was heavy as a kid. So I'm looking forward to trying to lift it as a 33 year old. I, I like, have you, I, and I know this is, but have you imagined winning the Stanley cup and in particular with the Toronto Maple Leafs? I mean, I think you always try to visualize it. Uh, that feeling that, you know, one of the, one of the worst things that I always put myself through for some reason is watching uh, the team that wins it, the celebration after, 
because I, I want to, I, I get like a sick feeling, you know, when I see it, but also an, 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 like an excitement that like, that's what I'm missing, you know? And I, so I put myself through it every year and I hate it, but I do. <laughs> I know when they're going to come, you know, that game you start to watch. Cause I don't really pick up the playoffs after I'm done. I don't really pick it up till the Stanley cup finals. Anyway, just too emotional, yeah. and too pissed off. And um, so then you start to watch kind of as, okay, game three, you know, there are three games, they got three games and, and you, know, you start watching the fourth game. Can they win it? Can they win it? So, yeah. And then I watched that celebration and I just, Absolutely. I picture it. I think you have to, I think you have to visualize that moment. I think you have to you know, wonder what it's going to feel like. And um, so that you, you yearn for it, you know? So I, I know like right now I have a great opportunity in front of me. Uh, it's not an easy road by any means, but an opportunity is all you can ask for. 16 teams have a chance to win the cup and so many things have to go right and you got to grind and you got to push, but that's why you see the guys crying and hugging each other. And man, I, I would love that opportunity. I would, I mean, that's just something that fires me and continues to fire me until I get it. The old uh, reporter in me would have ended the interview after that great uh, response. However, I'm going to ruin it with asking uh, the internet sensation of what is your favorite cheat snack? <laughs> we have to ask, we have to ask. I know that's the amazing. Of that was brutal. Oh, you just gave, you just gave this incredible answer, yeah. and now we got to find out your cheese snack. And the whole we time he's given this answer, I'm like, I know. "How am I going to ask this question?" I was, I was End the interview, Wally. Thinking, How do we wrap this up now? Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, I'm not even mad. That's actually probably the best way to do it. So, what is your favorite cheat snack? <laughs> um, oh God, I was about to cry. Now I'm now I'm about now. Uh, <laughs> It's a whole different world now that everything is so like changed. snack. Like, what are we talking about? Like, 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 like mine, sit- mine. Yeah. Mine's like, I oh. melt cheese curds, like an absolute degenerate. And I put salt and olive oil on it. It's weird. So anything like that, like, do you do something just bizarre? That's bad for you. I mean, that sounds pretty good actually. Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, uh, I love cheese. it for some reason. That's just like thing that popped into my head since you said cheese curds, but I don't really have like a snack that I'm, I don't know. I'm not pizza. Really... Do you like? Is do you have a cheat meal? Like, what do you? You got? You got to have something, Nick. When you let like, your hair down, what yeah. is it that well, you sit hair, on the couch? My hair, got, my hair got let down a long time ago. Uh, maybe that's why too many cheat snacks. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm I, I'm like a I'm a salty guy. Like I like chips. I love yeah. salt and vinegar chips. Yeah, savory All stuff. Chips. Yeah, like that's yeah. me. So like I'm okay. not even a big chocolate dessert guy. I'm not on the road like that's like okay honestly my favorite snack is probably grilled cheese like that's my that's a good one that's a good one i love it like if you could my grandmother used to make me i used to in junior she has a george foreman and i she used to make them on a george foreman and i loved them because they had like it was crispy and they had little waves to them and then that with potato chips oh my god okay yes there you go is that better oh yeah regular potato chips though like yeah i Whenever I have a sandwich, it has to be like a regular potato chip. Absolutely. Like a ruffle or yeah. a la- like Lace. original. So Amazing. is there is there ketchup on your uh, grilled cheese? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> You're the guy that eats cheese curds for crying out loud. I, know, I think we got some leeway here. <laughs> but it kills me here. Because my, kids, my kids eat it with ketchup. Like my oh. wife, they're all dippers. So they have dips, sauces and everything. And it's just like, I didn't grow up with that. It was like, here's what you're eating. There's no Same. special like my mom's Italian sauce, you're not putting ketchup back on that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I just, I never had sauces. So I got to her family and they got all these extravagant sauces that go, they're a French Canadian culture. So they just got crazy things and it's delicious. I'm not mad. It's, they've turned me into a dipper, um, especially the mustard and mayo combination. That's a big what? one. What? Yeah. Yeah. On what? Very good. Try it out. Oh, game changer. Kind of everything to be honest with you. Because I'm French, I'm French Canadian, and we yeah. don't, I don't think no. I've ever heard that before. Oh, yeah, I don't know, man. I must okay, whatever. I'll try it tonight. I'm going upstairs different, right now. Why are you making short ribs? I'm gonna yeah. dip short ribs in it. There you go. Yeah, no, that's I mean, we do like, like chicken cutlets and all those things with it, but uh, they're yeah, anyway, that's that's kind of but my kids are all dippers, so it drives me crazy because they're just <laughs> grilled cheese. I'm like, it's I made you a perfect grilled cheese. Why are you dipping this? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah, yeah. Like he's losing out of the bread and they're they're dipping it. Oh my god, you know what? Yeah, I, fair I, enough. I See, so. this went from a bad question to a great answer. So and, and now I'm 
perfect thing. So thanks. I know I'm thinking this. I don't have grilled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm hoping you can find it in your hotel room while you quarantine. Um, but we appreciate you taking this time. I, it was an interview that we were looking forward to doing. And so uh, we wish you all the best in Toronto and, and hope uh, all the success for you, my friend. Thank you. It's so nice to see you guys. And thanks yep. for uh, chatting with me. Now I'm going to go back to my solitude here. So <laughs> Good luck. Thanks, I look boys. forward to seeing you on the ice. Uh, take care. Yeah, now. me too. Me too. Thanks a lot, guys. Good to see you. All right. Welcome back to the show. Please be joined now by national champion hockey coach Greg Carvel, one time former Ottawa Senator head coach but my friend congratulations on winning a national title I, I know you probably haven't had a whole lot of downtime what's it been like for you uh, a little bit surreal I, I think any championship uh, I, I said earlier today another interview four times I've been in a, a championship two Stanley Cups and two national championship games and I was old for three so I'm starting to wonder, but I, I felt like this time we actually we were the team that was supposed to win. And I, in all four situations, the first three times we were the underdog and, and we didn't win. And today, or uh, this time, I felt like we deserved to win. Uh, you talk about UMass winning this championship, but go back two years and you, I mean, you've rebuilt this program, but two years ago you were in a national championship. And I think I've heard you say you knew that you guys perhaps weren't ready for that one. And what did it do to lead to this one? We were only two years into the rebuild here. So our whole team was freshmen and sophomores. We were very young. We obviously were, we were led by Kale McCarr, um, but we had 10 kids return from that team and play in this game. And we got pretty well throttled three, nothing by Duluth and really learned what it took and how you needed to play. And so for the next two years, we, we really became a very good defensive team. We got heavier, we got deeper, older, and the program was just able to mature. And then uh, we throttled St. Cloud 5 nothing. So we learned a lot. Take me through that game then. And I guess at what point do you know you're about to be national champions? Is it early on or is it not till the third period? When did you realize that, you know, this dream is going to be a reality? I, I kind of knew in the morning skate. We, we gave the kids the, the day off in between and they were absolutely buzzing. I've never felt the energy. The kids knew it. And I was a little nervous. I asked my assistants, I said, do I need to ramp these guys down? And, uh, <laughs> you know, the game didn't start great. They hit, uh, they hit the crossbar early on. Game could have gone a different way. But once we scored, we got up 2 nothing, and the kids played great defensively. I think we'd only given up eight shots through halfway through the game, and it was a really dominant effort. And I'm meeting with kids right now. They're, we're having exit meetings, and they're all saying that we knew we were going to win. I'm like, oh, Thank God you did. I, you know, I was afraid it's going to be over four, and uh, but it was four nothing after two periods, and we're a very good defensive team. So obviously, uh, and we scored the fifth the early in the third. So the last ten minutes were re the most enjoyable ten minutes I've ever spent at bench because I'm usually quite anxious, and to know that they're going to give us a big trophy at the end, it was fun to watch these kids carry it right down to the last buzzer. You use the term anxious, but I think other people might use the term uptight. You are a very stoic kind of guy who's always in it. And I'm just curious, when was it you were allowed to like breathe? Was it that 10 minutes to go or no. were you ever in an intermission? Okay. I, uh, it's funny. There's a minute left in the game and it's five, nothing. And somebody missed an assignment and I screamed as loud. As loud. <laughs> I, you know, guys are looking at me and I'm like, that's right, right till the end, you know, and that's really important that that's the message they get all year. Absolutely. Everything's done right. It doesn't matter the circumstances. And uh, I think it was just natural for me. I understood that I'm being a bit foolish at that point, but got to stay true to who you are. Uh, you don't know this, but this is probably, well, you, maybe you do, but I, I don't know that you're a big viewer of the show yet is you've, this is your second appearance on our show because earlier on when you guys won the regional, we showed the video of you, what do we say, high-stepping it across the ice to meet your team. Can you take us through this? Uh, we also tried to time it. I think it's a land speed record for the time it took for a man to run across the ice. Yeah. Uh, all of us who, you know, play hockey, we, we know how to handle ourselves on the ice with skates or without. So people who don't play think it's pretty impressive. Mark knows he could probably, you know, we all can do it. 
I There's no chance he can do that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we also, in the year of COVID, we went to wearing quarter zips instead of suits. So I had, I had sneakers on. I didn't have dress shoes, which probably just, you know, probably revealed too much. But uh, we have a tradition that when you move on to the next level, uh, we, we're moving on to, to the Frozen Four. Uh, we meet at center ice and we link arms and it's, it, it's, it goes deep into the culture of the team and it's a, it's a great tradition. And there was no way I was going to miss that. And so, you know, I was on with, with future grass and Barry Melrose and I was like, I, I got to go. And I ripped the headphones off and I, I knew, I didn't know what camera was on me, but I knew I was just kind of, I was happy. And so I just had the arms go on, you know, like that. <laughs> And then at one point, I'm like, well, I'm going pretty fast here, but I know they'll catch me. So I, I slid into a group of them and no harm, no foul. No, it was pretty good. We, I, I watched you throughout this and it's very impressive what you've been able to build. So can you take me back to the beginning of you leaving St. Lawrence to take over this program? Didn't have a very good reputation. No, it was a, it was a surprise. It was a very hard decision. St. Lawrence is my alma mater. Uh, Canton, New York is my hometown. That's why coaching in Ottawa was great. I was an hour and a half, you know, just over the border uh, in New York state. Um, so I'm coaching at my alma mater. I'm pro probably going to be there forever. Happy. And then uh, UMass approached me. We did, I, I turned St. Lawrence around when I got there, they were near the bottom of the league. And a couple years later, we were at the top. And so I'd shown that I could turn a program around and, and UMass needed that. And, uh, St. Lawrence didn't do a lot to, uh, to try to keep me. And so that basically was why I left. And when I got to UMass, I was, I was one of these total, oh my God, what have I done? I'd made a big mistake. You know, one of the, uh, it was in shambles, but luckily I hired really good assistants. And then I hired I got my staff's top notch. And um, my first year we lost our last 17 games in a row. And that's hard to do. But um, we only won five games. We lost 17 in a row to end the year. Five years later, uh, we went, we went for the last 14 games of the year without a loss. So we, we, we flipped the script. And most of it was just, uh, you know, you get, you get the odd Kale McCarr. Uh, you got a, we've got a couple kids in the NHL now that, that have really helped get us to that first national championship game. But it's really depth of culture, a depth of character. We have a large group of really high character kids and we really challenge them it's a lot of hard coaching uh but you know it's it's built on trusting relationships and, and connection and that's where to me true development happens when there is that trust between players and coaches and it's the it's the beautiful part of coaching at this level is it's not a revolving door you're not getting traded you're not getting sent down um we're, you're in it together at least during the course of a year and it allows you to really build culture and set tone, set the tone from the top. Um, and you don't get fired for wins and losses. You, you know, your athletic director, if he knows you're bringing in good kids, you're holding them to high standards in the classroom and they're good, good kids in the community. Uh, you can lose a couple games and still sleep at night. Um, so my time in Ottawa, seven years, four head coaches, so I was fortunate to stay around that long, but, um, you know, I don't have to have that worry at this level. Like, is, it, you, is it safe to, is it safe to say then that you're pretty comfortable staying at that level? Is there any chance you'd ever go back to the NHL? It's at some point I would, um, you know, people ask me a lot of time, absolutely no one from the NHL is knocking on my door. So it's not something I worry about. Um, I understand that maybe, you know, I put in myself in a conversation, but, uh, I've got a younger family. I'm treated very well here. I think this is a really good place for me. Um, you know, down the road and my kids are all out of the house and, you know, maybe. Uh, but as we talked about, you know, stability is a really important thing. And you guys know that, especially for family. It was really hard to uproot them this last time. And uh, it was hard on all of us. And it's not something I necessarily looking to do unless someone you know knocks your socks off and it needs to be a really good situation i i, I talked to other coaches who are considering it and i'm like yeah go for it just know that in two years you watch you better have another plan it's great to get there pretty quickly they're they're 
you know, looking for the next guy. Yeah. And it's so you, you better have a good relationship with the GM. You better be in a, in a team that's on the up, go on the uprise and is willing to be a little patient with you. Um, I think David Quinn was an example of a really good situation. He was at BU, didn't want to leave, but they basically paid him enough that he left. It was a good situation, young team, you know, on their way up. Uh, it had to be something like that. You talked about uh, being in Ottawa for seven years and four head coaches, but the one constant was Brian Murray, who brought you over from Anaheim. What was the relationship like with you and him? And I, I guess how much did he mold your career as to where you are now? Yeah, he he inherited me in, in Anaheim. <laughs> he came in as the head coach. I was a uh, scouting coordinator under Pierre Gauthier. Another, uh, so Pierre Gauthier hired me. Uh, I know you have history with him. It was he called the ghost. Was that his nickname? The ghost. Yeah. The ghost. Because he was GM with the Ottawa senators. Yeah. So, uh, Brian came in as a head coach and then replaced Pierre as the GM. And I'll always remember that first day I'm in my office, just knees shaking. Like I hadn't met Brian yet. He went in and sat down with him and, and you, you, you know, pretty instantly he's a, just a great human being and, he just basically asked me, Hey, you'd be interested in filling the video, you know, coaching spot with Mike. And uh, then it took a little while to convince Mike because I was an American and he didn't think Americans knew anything about hockey. And, <laughs> um, but the, we ended up having that first year. We had that great run to the, to the finals. Uh, we, you know, we rode Jaguar uh, to the finals and I learned, started my, really my education in hockey were uh, with Brian and I know Mike is, you know, under the spotlight right now for a lot of negative reasons, but yeah. I learned a lot from him about coaching. And I learned a, more from Brian over 10 years about how you treat people. And Brian was always about you get the most out of players by how you treat them. He's like, he's like Greg, you and your systems, like they don't matter. And, uh, <laughs> and he was, you know, the guys really love playing for them. They didn't guys don't necessarily love playing for an X's and O's guy. I mean, everybody can do X's and O's, but who can relate to the players and, and get the most out of them and understand how to manage a game. And, and if a guy's going, you know, get him out there and all those things. And Brian was old school. He was, you know, he liked the guys who dropped the gloves and, and, you know, you went out and you had beers after the game, you had beers the night before a game, like it was old school. And it was all um, really influential. It, he treated me like gold for 10 years. And I know eventually uh, he had to fire me. Uh, and I understand at the time it was really hard uh, to, to uh, digest. But his last couple of years when he was sick, I, I would send a lot of texts just really wanting to share what he meant to me. And um, I was in coaching it out in Denver last year. We played at Denver and uh, his wife, Jerry was out there with one of their daughters and she came to the game and we, she came downstairs before the game and, you know, we just hugged each other. And, and I said, Jerry, I, I told Brian everything I wanted to. And she said, I know he told me all of it and he really appreciated it. And so I think that's really important. It was really important to me that I was able to, to thank him and, and show my gratitude to him and that he received it. That, that was really important to me because he was so, uh, he, you know, he's, he's about the same age, the same age as my dad. And uh, he was a second father, but probably way more a friend. And I felt so fortunate to be under his wing for as long as I was. And I know you guys had a special relationship. and It was always obvious to see. Um, I'm curious of all the guys that you had coming through Ottawa, was there anyone that, that you marveled at particularly? Was there anyone that really stood out to you? And I, I think you had Carlson at, as a rookie, if I'm not mistaken. I had Carlson for the first two years and I, I was running the defense then. And, you know, my favorite memory of him was, it's probably his, his first year, you know, penalty and I ran the penalty kill too. And we get a penalty and he started looking back at me. And I'm like, stop doing that. You know, you know how it is. And he'd be like, put me out there. And, and I started to, and he's just, he was so smart. You know, he just could anticipate the play. And Mark, you played with him for, for a long time. 
Um, so it was fun to coach Eric. He was young and, and green. And um, the name that you, you'll probably won't be surprised. My, one of my favorite players was Chris Kelly. And he was, uh, we did a lot of extra work on the ice post, post practice almost every day. Uh, we, we tried to create some hands, you know, it was, it was an everyday project, but I loved the way <laughs> he was, I loved the way he played the game. You know, he was just win face off block shots, check stuff that doesn't, you know, I think we all appreciate him. And then he goes to Boston and was really appreciated there as well. And I, I got to see him last year. I was at a Bruins game for some media uh, and he was there. So it was great to see him, but it, it'll always be Alfie. It'll always be Alfie. He, to me, he was the consummate. Um, did it all played yeah. through, played through injuries, made big plays, just everything. And uh, you know, I get asked about Hall. You think Alfie's Hall of Fame? I, I do. I, I mean, I coached some Hall of Famers. I, I think he's a Hall of Fame. I, I thought he was just absolute wonderful player. He was fantastic. Now, since you brought up Chris Kelly and not being able to help him score, clearly you may win a national championship, but you're not a miracle worker. Um, so going back to your uh, NCAA team, we're talking a lot in Ottawa lately about guys leaving school and making the decision to go. Now, as a head coach, I know you've got to have these conversations with players. So what's it like for you to try and convince these guys to stay in school? You think you have some sway because you've worked at that level. And uh, I, I realized that I just need to be quiet. I just need to say, hey, I, I think you could use another year. Uh, once you leave here, nobody's going to care about you like you do here. You, you're going to be a piece of meat, and uh, you don't get many chances to make a first impression. And I think you, you should stay another year. It's, it's if that's the truth, that's what I'll tell them. If yeah. you are uh, John Leonard, who's who left signed after his junior year last year, and he's went straight to San Jose and he scored highlight goals every every single game. You just give him a hug and thank him and wish him luck. Um, but problem is, is they, they listen to agents who want them to sign because they don't get paid until they sign and NHL teams will tell them whatever they want to hear. Once they sign the contract, doesn't matter. Whatever they promised, it doesn't matter. They don't, you can tell them that stuff and it's all their goals to get there. And, and, and the drafted kids, they do not want to upset the big team. They don't want to say no. Uh, but you know who did say no it was Kale McCarr. Kale McCarr, after his freshman year, Colorado wanted to sign him. And he's like, no, I'm not ready. I don't think I'm – and he wasn't. He he needed another year to physically mature. And then he stepped right in and was a really good player from day one. And kids want to get there sooner than they should. And the one guy that stayed longer than he should went on to be a star uh, from day one. Is there pressure to repeat for you? Like, I know every team changes, so how do you approach next season? And have you given it any thought? Are you right back into it? Or are you just trying to enjoy the moment? I, I won't feel pressure to repeat. It's, it's too difficult to do that. Uh, it's just it's, the pressure is the day-to-day -day process and game-to-game. -game. I, I know what it takes for us to win, and – the, the, I, I never came here saying I'm gonna we're gonna win a national championship at UMass. My first contract. There's 12 teams in our league. I, I got a bonus if I finish in the top six. Like that was the expectation. You just finish in half, top half of the league. You'll have a job forever. And I wasn't sure that we'd be able to do that because they'd been in last place for a long time. Um, so there's no pressure to um, to repeat uh, again. If if I do my job well, I treat the kids well, I make them, you know, keep developing them. The wins are the byproduct of the process. Um, so I, I don't feel pressure ever to, to win games if I feel like we're doing a good job. Uh, Coach Carvey, like you've taken the program. I know you, you're riding a high of an NCAA title, but really the, the best work you've done is to take a program that used to be called Zoomass is my understanding. And you changed it into a national champion in five years. And I think, that says a lot about just what you've been able to do and, and your staff. Cause I know it's not just singly you, it, it, you have a huge staff that takes care of all that stuff with you. And so uh, from our side, 
we miss you in Ottawa. We enjoyed our time, uh, but congratulations on being a national champion, my friend. Thank you. If you guys ever open your country again, I I'd <laughs> to be there this summer. I got a lot of friends up there. And just, do you ever let Mark talk on this show or is it just, no, you know what, once in a while, he's got a little bit more experience than I do in this journalism business. So I just let him do his thing sometimes. <laughs> we, we I have, didn't know we he was a... there. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for having me guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Doing a great job. I do listen to your podcast. So keep it up. Thanks. thanks I appreciate it. Take care. All right. Welcome back to the show. Craig joins us now. Uh, be- Craig, before we get to trivia, I want to talk about some people don't realize that you are a lot of behind the scenes stuff when you work for the Ottawa Senators. You've seen a lot of things transpire that you were not supposed to talk about or couldn't. Uh, yes. That's not the case so much now. So I, one of the things is you get to be in the room uh, at draft time and all the discussions that take place. And one of those discussions is about Shane Pinto. Can you tell us this story? Yeah, well, when I, when I saw the rundown for today's show, I, I mean, obviously I watched uh, Shane's first game the other day and I saw kind of, we were talking a little bit of draft stuff and it, and it sparked that like, yeah, he was he was the first pick of day two of the 2019 draft in Vancouver. And it was a pretty unique pick, right? Because instead of 10 minutes to figure out who you're picking or if you're trading it or what, who's your guy or whatever, you have like all night. So after day one of the draft, we all go back to the hotel and the scouts all set up in a room and it was the room where the food was. So obviously we're going to sidle in there as well. And uh, they just spent all night kind of debating and there were trade offers and there was a guy they liked and a guy that they were kind of trying to figure out, is he going to be there or whatever? And um, the interesting part was there were, there were two players um, uh, that actually were picked right after Pinto and Kaliev and uh, Bobby Brink that uh, I think a lot of fans were really excited about that were still there and, um, there were teams that were interested in acquiring them. And uh, so it was neat to see, and, and Trent Mann and the scouts, like they just consummate professionals went through every scenario. They liked their guy and uh, they stuck to their guns and they picked them. And so it was kind of cool to see that night and, and its impact it had in last game, right. To finally see that guy two years later after that pick was, it was criticized by, by some fans because they had no idea who Shane Pinto was. Now they've, they've kind of seen what the scouting staff saw. So it was, it was neat to see kind of the behind the scenes and, the campaigning that goes on, right? Someone who, who likes them will, will really pitch them hard. And the other side will be like, hey, let's make this trade. And so it was pretty neat to see kind of Trent and Pierre Dorian and that team work and end up with a guy like Shane Pinto, who, who looks like he could be a, a solution in the top six uh, as a center for the Ottawa Senators here. Okay, so how close were they to moving him? And were there any heated discussions? Oh, yeah. Well, there were some heated discussions because I think the food was a little late too. Uh, but it's, uh, it it was, yeah, there was, there were some teams that wanted to pick up and, and I mean, again, I don't know all the details of everything, but half the time you kind of want to know who they're trading up to take, right? Like, especially if they're maybe moving a pick that's that that you're going to get, that's a few later, right? So you can figure out if he's your guy. And I don't think they ever really got that assurance that, that Pinto would be there a couple picks later or however many it was they had to move back. Um, so I, it's hard to say. Uh, I know that Pinto was at the top of the list uh, and he stayed there and that's the guy they took. So again, it's when they talk about best player available, like it's, this is why. So you take the best player available and you don't overthink things. And sometimes it makes sense to trade back and grab a guy. I'm pretty sure that's what happened with Bernard Docker actually. But um, with Pinto, I didn't think they, they weren't convinced that he wasn't going to be there at least one, even one pick later. So um, they, they just went and grabbed their guy. Okay, uh, we haven't really discussed Trent Mann, who's done phenomenal work uh, in the amateur side of things. So give us an idea how well or how he works. How does Trent Mann operate? He, he's like the ultimate facilitator. Like he's the middleman between everything. Uh, the scouts are, there's, man, I love, I, I love draft. That's why I'm, I'm excited for when we get to talk about it more. I love uh, hanging out and talking with the scouts because these are guys that they're on the road. 300 days a year going to hockey games by themselves and all they want to do is talk hockey and and it, they have so much great insight and they can tell you everything but it's Trent's job to kind of manage that so when you get a bunch of guys that they don't really see each other much uh, besides a few times a year at scouting meetings and stuff it's his job to kind of keep things moving along and keep them on track and remind them why they're there and it's it's not an easy job uh so getting to kind of see him and Pierre as well right they, those those two really kind of drive the scouting and, and that's why it's been such a strength for the organization, I think. Um, but to kind of see the, the, the battles in the room when they're pitching their guy or, or they'll, they'll, com- they'll completely take a guy right off their list for some reason. You know what I mean? It's, it's very interesting to see. And, and that night with Shane Pinto, you really got to kind of see the compressed version of it 
because they usually don't get that much time to really analyze and pull these things out. So it was really kind of cool to see. And it was especially cool to see that, that uh, even though he was wearing number 57, uh, it was kind of <laughs> cool to see him uh, get his first action and, and see that all that hard work come to fruition. I one other thing you'd bring up the number and it bugs me because I don't know why if you were considering him to be a piece of the future, just give him a number he wants that's not being used. Like, why are we being this way? Why has he got to wear 57? That's just yeah, dumb to me. The company line in me would say, like, well, he's got to earn it and you ah, can't show him special treatment. But I mean, these nonsense. guys just like they just they just you convince them to leave school to to commit to you. And give him, give him, give him the number he wants, right, or, or whatever. I mean, if it's a guy on the team that has it, I get it. But this is your first game, right? Like you're always going to look back at your first game, and you're wearing some number you have no association to. I don't know. I, I think it's it's one of those things that I I understand. You got to make you got to earn your ice. No, nope. you hold on a spot. second. Tim Stutzla but, didn't have to earn his spot. Yeah, he got I, this, number eighteen I, as soon as he signed. So let's let, like let's stop this nonsense already. He's a first rounder. Yeah, he's third overall. <laughs> but Shane Pinto is thirty second. Like. If you're doesn't gonna, matter. If he's coming to the lineup and he's going to play a game, why not just give him the number? Just like, what number do you want, kid? I'd like 12. Yeah. Okay, nobody's using it. Here yeah. it is. Instead of it being like this sacred number that nobody can use, <laughs> stop. It's just what it's they do. Number. It's It's been like that. When I got into the league, yeah. it was the same thing. I got I, some pigeon number when I started off. It was 48, 48. Worst, number in the, <laughs> worst number in the NHL. And uh, – and then a first rounder from my draft year, even sometimes the second rounder, but mostly just the first rounders would get their, you know, their, their regular number. So it's just the way it is. It's, it's a, that old school train of thought, but it's still trickling into the game today. But that's what I'm saying. Like enough with the old school train of thought. A lot of it doesn't with work you. anymore. So let's just, <laughs> I'm just saying, just, I know it it's is a small it thing. It just bugs the hell out of me that we're cons- yeah. Good. Oh, kid, you got to earn well, your number. And fifty-seven like you, is that's a tough number too. Like that's that's a linebacker number. That's yeah, not even a hockey yeah. number. Yeah. No, like like just throw the kid a bone for his first game. He gets his pictures taken wearing uh, fifty-seven. Well, the worst Stop. part, the worst part is that like so, I had tw- number twenty-nine as well for a little while before they finally gave me three. And so all my rookie cards yeah. are uh, like it's like a mixture of number forty-eight and twenty-nine. <laughs> You know what I mean? Whereas if I had three right from the get-go, then my rookie card would have number three. But I suppose if you don't collect hockey cards, nobody gives a a, a shit. Well, they did back when you started playing because it was so long ago uh, that everybody had rookie cards or hockey cards back then. But I don't like, was number three available when you were there? I think so. But I think think there was another player at the time uh, in the organization, a forward, who was getting called up a little more frequently than I was clearly. And okay. he had number three. So I think okay. that was the, the conflict. Like, I, anyway, I, I just, it's it doesn't matter. It's I know st- it's silly, but, but it, it's a bad number. Like it's not pleasing to look at, you know what I mean? When you're watching yeah. the game, like when I watched the Montreal game, you're just seeing 57 floating around. And you're like, that's a brutal number. I feel and bad for these kids. And it was weird to see 57 and 59 play on the same line. Like that one, like, yeah. I was just thrown. And then look, 63 is the other, right? Yeah. I mean, Ottawa's not like a team that has a million jerseys retired either, right? Like a lot, they no. have to recycle a lot of them. And if you can go, with no. like, yeah, I mean, if you can wear like number 12, right? That's Mike Fisher. Who cares, right? Like he, he wore yeah. 10, year, 10 years ago. Like, I think we can move well, on. Well, I hesitated when I grabbed three, when I yeah. came to Ottawa, I was a little hesitant because the previous player was Chera. And I'm thinking like, okay, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be wearing this number. <laughs> but then a bunch of guys like assured me, they're like, no, 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 it's fine. Just take the number. I'm like, okay. So yeah, I can understand I, the hesitation. I can only understand 11 and maybe four. And now they're yeah. retired, right? But before they were retired, right. if you came to t- like, you're not getting 11, that's obvious. But any other yeah. number that's not retired, who cares? It's not I sacred. I think part well, of it too. Well, you know, there's an is. argument to be made from a passionate fan that it is sacred. Yeah. You know, from our perspective, it isn't. But I'm just playing devil's advocate here, Wally. Don't take my head off. No, no, I... <laughs> But I'm just, unless you know, like Ray Bork's number, you were never going to wear coming in before it was retired, right? People like, wear it all the time. I know. So if it's on a different, I, I anyway, I, yeah, it's just I hear dumb you. To me, I hear you. It's childish and immature. But if you go to Boston, <laughs> do you wear 77? Well, no. But I mean, even before it was retired, and let's say he was, no, that's he had what moved I'm saying. On. Yeah. But if those, like those three years before they retire it, you know that one of the sure. greatest players, and if you're a top 100 player in the NHL in history, 
then they, no, no one's going to take your number. Like you wouldn't go and yeah. wear Matt Sundin's number in Toronto, but yeah. it's not retired. So we really trailed off here. I know, it, but it's just, yeah, I like it. <laughs> It's, bu- it's bugging me. It just bugs me. This, this whole this number is a whole thing new is segment. Nonsense. Yeah, no, I get it, Wally. I get it. I get anyway, it. Like, so it's that the was same, the story like... of Shane Pinto's night that he was drafted. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, uh, you know what? It was really <laughs> trivial, and now that's a perfect segue into trivial trivia presented by GogShow.com. Greg. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what? Let's give away. Uh, we we got a we got something to give away here from the last show, right? Where we had uh, we had talked about uh, the Kid Rock interview. Sorry, the Kid Rock interview. The Kid Rock story from uh, Jamie McClendon's interview. Uh, he he had asked a question, and he had asked, uh, "What specialty food did Kid Rock make for Jamie?" And of course, the answer, boys, you got it. Bologna. But well, yeah, fried bologna sandwich. Or, yeah. uh, I've never had one. Have you guys had one? So in in Nashville, when you get um, when you've had a lot, when the bars are closing, let's just put it that way. There's a place you can go and get these fried bologna sandwiches because all the restaurants are shut down or whatever. And people bring them back to like legends and we just sit around a table and eat these bologna sandwiches. So yeah, I've had. Them. That sounds good. Yeah. I've they, are, they are really good. You're like, like I, I, feel, I feel like if you're drunk or you're not feeling great, it's like a comfort food, right? Yeah. Right up there with like pizza and burgers. Yeah. Like yeah. Street hot dog or something. And it's like yeah. five bucks. Bread and meat. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's sounds good really to me. Good. We're doing yeah, it again. Okay, We're trailing cool. off again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a bunch of people again got it right. Shout out to everyone who listened to that interview and, and nailed it. So especially at Belanger twenty six, Eric will be reaching out shortly because you just won yourself a fifty dollar gift card to Napoli's in Stittsville. So shout out to that. Now nice. today we're giving away more stuff. We got another Gong Show sauce off kit to give away, um, and we're going to use a little uh, question from Nick Felino's thing. So. What is Nick Felino's favorite snack? Love that question. Uh, send us your answers on Twitter. Using I don't know who we're paying for this, but they've know. got to come up perhaps a different question. We need, sna- we need some snack sponsors here. Uh, <laughs> send your answer to Twitter using the hashtag Wally Mathot. Contest closes on Wednesday, April 17th at noon Eastern, and we will reveal the winner on Thursday's show. Okay, I got a question for both of you now since we're way off topic here. When you come home after a night out, what snack is it that you eat when you're perhaps inebriated Matt, do you want to go oh, first you're that you're yeah. that like let's go yeah. college let's go like like 19 20 years old yeah i was gonna say because now i don't really do that anymore I've yeah got kids so waking yeah. up no you're much more responsible with, yeah. yeah well sort of uh yeah in the past it would have been either like it's whatever i had around the house but it was usually either like mac and cheese or i just fry up some eggs really? yeah i'm a that's, that's I was like brec- a breakfast food guy. Like, so I'd go, and if I wasn't doing it at home, I was either at like Zach's Diner downtown or Dunn's having like a full blown breakfast, like a degenerate <laughs> at 2 30 in the morning. There's, you know what? Breakfast is the mm-hmm. best meal because you can have it any time of the day. I would eat that all yeah, day. And long. It's just easy. It goes down easy. It's nice. Yeah. It's relaxing. Yeah. It's morning, anyways. Right? right. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, I see, I don't eat Like, one thing I don't eat is I don't eat McDonald's. I can't. I just, I never feel good. The only time I ever eat it is like at three in the morning on the drive through, <laughs> way home. I'll eat something. So if it's not that, I'm a big proponent of the old gas station chips pop in a bar where you'll go oh. in, you'll grab, you'll grab a, a Gatorade, maybe a dirty bag of chips, some of it, and then they just disappear. It's, you never feel worse. There's than nothing you wake satisfying up. sounding about no. any of that. You just, oh, no, nope. Like it's Case. right out of a bag. <laughs> ah, you just mow it down you have salty you got sweet you got liquid. nobody i'm surprised nobody said pizza like pizza is no, another uh, one that i like yeah i i used to love uh <laughs> cheese whiz so you put it on some bread and then you put it in the microwave for like 15 seconds so you have melted <sighs> cheese whiz and a bowl of cheerios okay how how, <laughs> how hammered were you <laughs> yeah really <laughs> I, I enjoyed just, the night out. I'm just picturing Wally stumbling <laughs> through his kitchen, like pouring cheese whiz on bread and thinking it's a good idea. Anyway, yeah, you uh, turning I, I, the I, stove I, on. Uh, well, that can I put me. a little more work into it, but but it was good. Yeah, cheese whiz is really good when you're like 19, 20. Well, on that note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fine. We'll we'll get out of here. Thanks to Nick Felino, Greg Carvel for stopping by. A uh, big show for you coming up on Monday. We'll tell you all about that later. Uh, guys, appreciate all the time and all the extra stories. See you on Monday. See you guys. Adios. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show.